Echo? We do. Are we good to go? Yeah, okay, great. Um, do we need to do a roll call? Do we need to do a roll call? I say yes, do a roll call since Georgie's okay. online. All right, George. Wait, you're, you're, we, we saw your mouth move, but we didn't hear you. We still didn't hear you. Um, I think it might be a tech issue. I think it might not be you, George. It might be us. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Okay, Laura. Here. Kurt. Here. ML. Here. Mark. Here. Sarah. Here. Okay. All right. Uh, public participation is the first order of the day. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak or anyone online? Hi, Sarah. This is Vivian. I think we have to read the rules first. Yeah, but do we have anyone online who wants to speak? Yes, there are some hands raised, at least one hand raised. Okay, I'll and do just a, rem just a reminder, this is to speak to non-agenda items, this open comment session. All right, so that means if it's if there is if the item you want to speak to is a public item today, uh, hold your comments until we get to that public item. Otherwise, you can talk about anything you would like for three minutes. Vivian, go ahead and do the or Amanda. Yeah, I'll read our rules of decorum this evening. Thank you. Um, the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, safe staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, you can visit our website. The following are rules of decorum for this evening. Vivian, can you go back one slide, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, found in the Boulder Revised Code, these are our rules of decorum for this evening and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to identify themselves using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. For those that are joining us virtually, we're in the Zoom webinar format. When it is um, your turn, um, or when we do reach public participation and um, public hear for the public hearing items, you can raise your hand if you would like to speak. And then um, Vivian online will help you uh, adjust the settings so that you can may, may unmute yourself. Um, this is just a graphic showing you the, where you can find the raise hand button on the bottom of the bar um, under reactions. I mean, I think that's it. Thank you. Yep, that's it. All right, Vivian. Whenever. Okay. So now this is the time, the opportunity for uh, open comment. If you'd like to speak to anything that is not a public hearing item, please go ahead and raise your hand. And each person would have three minutes. So far, I see no hands. Give it a couple seconds. Okay. Uh, we have one, Lynn Siegel. Please go ahead, you have three minutes. Um, where's my... Um, we can hear you. Go ahead, Lynn. I... Hold on, Where... just hold the clock till Lynn figures it out. Where is my timer? Vivian, can you please stop sharing your screen? I think that's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that should be okay now. Yay, now I see it. Thank you very much. Yeah, regarding the Peacock Place um, approval the other um, the other day, I remember from like five, eight years ago, well, Joe Kent, the guy who owned the place, he moved 
his his structure from 28th and baseline in 1964-67 to this area of unincorporated Boulder County out past the East Boulder Rec Center going south a little bit. Um, and he had to dig a well. Um, 50 years later, the well rusted out, so he got a new well. And then in 2013, that well got inundated somehow from the flood. So he wanted annexation. Um, but of course, the city wants to benefit from um, any annexations. And um, they weren't accepting of just him and his house there. Um, so he had proposed four houses at first, and that was denied. They wanted more benefit. But um, this is on floodplain area and riparian habitat and the mouse, jumping mouse and the other birds that are going around there and stuff. So it was um, contested. Also it was contested because the soccer fields when they were put in at East Boulder Rec Center were uplifted a great deal and it changed the alluvium and the flooding in the area is, is more impactful on the surrounding houses. Greenwood Meadows and um, Keywayden. So um, the 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 approval of this thing is really not okay. When the developer said they got a permit for the sewer line, that they they gave the city, and this was stated this way. I can I can give you the exact words from Chandler. Um, that apparently staff or someone discovered the developer gave the city a sewer easement along the east side of the development when they got their permit for the development so they did not have to use OSBT land or get Greenbelt Meadows approval. Well, this is not okay. Um, Karen Holwig, I believe she was on the OS, um, OSBT at the time, had heard about the sewer alignment and inquired with someone when this was this project was going to move ahead and was told that she would be informed and then she found out by seeing in the newspaper the other day that it was approved well you have to get your Thank permit you, Lynn. that's that's time first um for Please wrap it up with, with one final thought. thought thank you you know this is is there, is any, is like there anyone the, else is there anyone else there's nobody else right. let me just thank check you. with andrew yeah there's nobody else Andrew Gedimi had his hand raised, but he lowered it. I think it's for later. Over to you. I'm sorry about that, Lynn, but three minutes is three minutes. Um, okay. Next is dis discussion of dispositions, planning board call-offs and continuations. We have two uh, for this first one. We have allocated 15 minutes if we are able to keep it to 15 minutes. Um, this is a call-up of site review to develop 1501 and 1509 Arapahoe Avenue with eight attached residential dwelling units with underground parking and two at-grade parking spaces behind the building. The development is proposed to be three stories in height that will not exceed the by right height of 38 feet. A subsequent preliminary plat under case number LUR 2023-00004 was approved to combine the two lots. The call-up period expires on February 7th, uh, 20, 2024. Um, several people had sent questions to staff. Do you want to raise those questions now. Okay, go ahead, Mark. <clears throat> so <clears throat> once again, I, I find myself discussing TDM uh, requirements in relation to uh, site review. And uh, so <clears throat> I have not decided uh, whether or not I'll call this up, but I wanted to ask the applicant, the applicants here tonight. Hi, Allison Blaine, senior uh, planner. The applicant is on the call tonight. Do they need to be admitted? Yeah, I think they need to be promoted. It's uh, Michelle is her name. Okay. Which Michelle? Allison? Uh, McNamara?
Hello, this is Michelle. Okay. Okay. All right, you ready to carry on? Okay. Ready. <clears throat> um, so, uh, the first question that, that Allison, um, I, I don't think fully um, uh, responded to, and, and not that, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a pejorative sense. I just uh, wanna uh, ask additional, from additional questions of the applicant. Um, your parking that you're proposing, the eight parking spaces, are those uh, <clears throat> separated and separately deeded or sold from the units, or are they titled with the unit? They are gonna be titled with the unit. So each unit is gonna have one parking space. Did you consider uh, using the parking management techniques that the city promotes, some separated, unbundled, managed, and paid uh, with uh, in, in your plan for the parking? So we are not opposed to that. We had thought that keeping one parking space with each, each unit would ensure that each unit had one spot for a car, which would minimize the potential congestion for on-street parking in the area. So I'll just comment to that. By, by titling um, a parking space with the unit versus separating it, uh, you are um, taking away the affordability of the person who chooses not to own a car. And so that is, uh, anyway, it's, 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 it's something that um, I uh, would have preferred to see you include in your, in your TDM plan. Um, <clears throat> I, I do believe you acknowledge that the uh, parking situation in the Goss Grove neighborhood is uh, people struggle with it. And um, I, I'm not sure how your TDM plan really addresses either the parking situation or the encouragement to live uh, using bike, e-bike, pedestrian transit. Um, do you consider your uh, TDM plan as submitted to be your final and best effort? So we had considered, so our goal was to minimize congestion to the surrounding area based on feedback from neighbors. So that's why we have the parking that we have proposed and then the bike parking. We tried to make it as convenient as possible with limited space that we have available to us. Um, to provide as much bike parking and alternative modes of transportation parking as possible. We also do plan to provide charging for not just cars, but also bikes uh, to, minim to allow for the most amount of accessibility to alternative modes of transportation as possible. Will that charging be in the garage and will it be in a secured uh, bike storage area where heavier, longer, uh, e-bikes can both be managed by someone that may not be able to uh, pick a pick an e-bike up and hang it on your space saving racks that you show in the drawings. We have discussed that and where the bike rack is shown, we can also provide a chain link fence enclosing the area, making it more secure, which would also allow for larger bikes, such as what you've described, to be placed and the charging is going to be within that area. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have a question for staff and that is, so here the decision to call up something or not based on an applicant's responses, is this not just kind of like a mini hearing or if, if an applicant, um, can an applicant make commitments at this stage or should I just call it up? Well, they can make commitments, but we're not approving conditions this evening. So um, it's, a, it's a promise. It, it would not be enforceable right. through the approval. All right, I'm just gonna cut this short. I'm gonna call this up. Did you have questions you wanted to put out to the applicant too? Did you, did you ask questions about this project? Uh, I don't think that I did. Okay. I have right. one question, but we can wait. If it's about this project, mm -hmm. go ahead. 
Okay. My question is just about the, the sidewalk on the Arapaho side on the south side. In the plans, the width wasn't clear to me. The applicant's proposal stated five foot sidewalk, but um, the DCS specifies eight foot sidewalk for a minor arterial, which, which Arapaho is. Can you just clarify the width in the plans? Um, the width is going to be the minimum required per code. So if it's eight foot, it will be eight feet. Um, we have everything up to the property line. So the sidewalk is going to be the width that it is. And then it will be, we, we know it'll have to meet code. Okay. And ML, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so my question is about the trees. Um, there are 15 trees, eight are being removed. And so the question I would be interested in is what criteria um, are used for allowing um, removal of trees? Some of them look like they're um, as close or far from the building and they're being removed. And I looked at the legend um, and the caliper is similar. So it'd be nice to hear, um, and they're all in good condition, equally in good condition. None of them have anything above good, uh, whether they're being retained or removed. So that would be something that I'd be interested in, in seeing some clarification on. Yeah, we're happy to um, clarify both those things the, on the sidewalk with and then um, the landscaping when we bring it back for the call-up hearing. Thank you, Charles. All right. All right, we'll move on to call-up item B. Use review to allow residential uses on the ground floor facing a street in an industrial service one zone district. The proposal includes the redevelopment of the existing site with two new residential buildings containing 21 three-story townhome townhouses, townhouse units with private garages. The call-up period expires on February 12, 2024. Does it matter that there's no LUR number here? Or address. Hmm? Or address. Or address. Do we need that for the record? Hmm. Stand by. In the memo, it says it's 4725 Broadway, LUR 2022-00032. Great, thank you. All right, now I, I think uh, Mark, you all both had, somebody had comments on this. Um, I have a comment, but I'm, I'm not going to call it up. You're not gonna call it, okay. Do you wanna make your comment though? Yeah, I'll make a comment. <laughs> okay. um, uh, this was, I found this particular one to be distressing only in one respect, and that is that the uh, design as shown um, would be something I would want to call up, but it's, since it's a use review, we can't. But I, I would encourage the applicant to um, revisit their design, potentially scrap the um, the design as it is now, and and start over with something that's worthy of the North Boulder area. And uh, it's just it's just pretty bad. I think it might be worth, who was it who was saying on the phone yesterday during the planning meeting that this is a unique one-off situation? I think it was you, Lisa. Do you want to just explain, come up and explain? Um, or Charles? It, yeah, it wouldn't have been Lisa. I mean, I, I think it's just unique in the sense that we don't see a lot of um, actual development projects through the use review process. We, you know, use reviews are typically about, um, the intensity of a use, um, you know, the hours of operation, operational characteristics. So in this case, it's it's pretty rare to have a, a development project that's being reviewed as a use review. And I can I can add something to that. I think that Sarah was referring to this is in the in an IS zoning district, and we no longer allow residential in the IS, IS zoning district. But this application was filed prior to that code change, and I think in the in the other I districts where we allow residential. Um, there's a site review requirement that kicks in much quicker. So we won't see any more of these types of projects in the IS1 zone along that corridor in North, North Boulder. Okay. Well, that's helpful to know, ML. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I asked this, Lisa, I'll, I'll ask it again, because it's still not clear to me um, that the uh, North Boulder sub-community plan um, identifies this as being in a service industrial area. And I understand that the use review is looking at allowing residential on the ground floor. Is that, am I understanding that? That's what's in front of us? That's right. Because otherwise residential is allowed in that former version. Right. Yeah, if, um, if residential was only above the first floor, not facing a street, I think that's also a qualifier, then no use review would be required. Correct. Okay, so that to me is the thing I'm wondering about. If our intention, um, and uh, it appears to me that the um, North Boulder subcommunity plan intention is to, is to support the retention of the small service uh, businesses that are um, typical in that area. Uh, I am wondering why staff feels that we should allow residential on the ground floor. You know, again, I think it's a balance. The, um, the area plan talks about preserving light industrial uses, but it also talks about integrating housing. Um, it talks about mixed use. It talks about live work. Um, so a variety of housing types. And, you know, our council declared a housing crisis a few years ago. Um, and the residential use is something that can be considered through the use review process. So there's a process mechanism for, um, for you guys to consider that. So I think from a staff perspective, balancing it with all of the other goals and objectives of the North Boulder sub-community plan, um, it seemed like residential on the ground floor and a purely residential um, you know, project here felt supportable. Mm -hmm. And Allison, please let me know if you had anything to add. No, no, that was perfect. That was what I was going to say. Thank you, Charles. Allison, can you remind what is around that particular parcel on the ground level? Is that is it surrounded by industrial uses? Um, there's some industrial uses um, immediately to the south, um, and then across the street. Um, you know, you have the, the armory that um, some mixed use um, residential. Um, the Comfort Inn and Suites um, hotel is immediately to the north. So there is a variety of uses in that area, including industrial, commercial, and residential. Sorry to chime in, but directly adjacent is- I'm sorry, you have to uh, announce your name, please. I'm sorry, this is Andrew Gadimi. Um, I am bringing the project forward as the developer. Uh, directly adjacent on, text, on 10th Street is a residential neighborhood, and directly across the street is uh, the Comfort Suites Hotel. Also, at, currently there is no road, and we initially submitted as a use by right, but after three years of negotiation with the city, it became clear that we would need to extend Zamiya Road, thus creating this need for a use review by creating the street. Um, do you know how many existing small businesses are going to be displaced? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are, I actually, if, if you're ready, I, I have something to say that really outlines the project. If if I could have the time or would you like me to just address your questions and yeah, save that's, comments? That's my to, last question. Yeah. Just address the question, please. Okay. Um, there are four businesses, two auto shops, one luxury camper van, and a marijuana grow. We have uh, we have negotiated, not we've negotiated, all of their leases stipulate the development, and all of them have been made aware, and we're working with every single one of the current tenants or tenants that have current leases to move <laughs> them into uh, other spaces of ours before development agrees in the city of Boulder or county. Thank you for your, thank you for coming forth with your answers. Th that's it for me and I will not be calling this up. Okay, thank you all. All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go on to the public hearing items. Uh, agenda item A, public hearing and consideration of a site review amendment and height modification request 
to allow for up to seven feet, six inches of additional height for each townhome building within the approved Shining Mountain Waldorf School PUD, allowing for a pitched roof design on the third level. Uh, reviewed, I'm sorry, there's also a second option, <laughs> uh, which was in, included in the proposal, but not in the agenda title. Reviewed under case number LUR 2023-00050. We've set aside an hour for this. And um, we'll start with a 15 minute staff presentation. Take it away. All right, thank you, Sarah. And good evening, planning board members. Um, as Sarah just mentioned, this is a uh, request to review a site review amendment application uh, to amend the Shining Mountain Waldorf School development to allow for up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof, or alternatively up to four feet of additional height with or without a pitched roof for each of the townhome buildings. Uh, in terms of public notification, <clears throat> written notice was sent to property owners within 600 feet of the subject site. Notice was also posted on the property. Uh, staff has received comments and questions from five residents, as well as a uh, letter of opposition signed by five residents, uh, which came in today, which I believe you all have seen. Uh, Shining Mountain Waldorf School has existed in the same location west of 10th and Violet since 1983. It was found, uh, since it was founded, the school has expanded to provide a full kindergarten through high school curriculum in the Waldorf tradition for the Boulder community. Uh, this, meanwhile, the land holdings for the school have increased up to about 11 uh, plus or minus acres. Um, so in 2021, LUR 2019-00068 was approved, which was a site review for phase consolidation and redevelopment of the school facilities and redevelopment of a portion of the property with single family and townhome units uh, subject to design guidelines. Uh, at the same time, a use review was also approved to update the management plan for the private school. Uh, and recently in um, 2023, a site review amendment was approved to allow for the subdivision of the townhome lot into 17 individual lots and to remove uh, phasing requirements that had been in there for the single family dwellings. The BVCP land use designation is low density residential, which consists predominantly of single family detached units at a density of two to six units per acre. The zoning of the site is RL2 which is defined as medium density residential areas, primarily used for small lot residential development, including without limitation duplexes, triplexes, or townhouses where each unit generally has direct access at ground level. Um, under the current site review approval, the townhomes are subject to the 35 foot maximum height limit for the RL2 zone. Uh, the majority of the site is located within the 100 and 500 year floodplains with the townhome site uh, following dedication of the Locust Avenue right-of-way being completely within the 100-year floodplain. Um, pursuant to section 933 of the Boulder Revised Code, uh, any person constructing a new residential structure shall elevate the lowest floor, including the basement, to or above the flood protection elevation. In this case, the flood protection elevation is approximately five and a half feet above the low point within 25 feet of the buildings from which height is measured. Um, so in terms of surrounding context, you can see here the site. It's immediately uh, across Violet Avenue from the 4403 Broadway site, which recently came in for the concept review for BMOCA. Um, across Broadway to the east is the Crestview West residential development. And to the northeast of the site, um, extending north up Broadway is uh, the Violet Crossing development, the new North Boulder Library site, and the uh, Uptown Broadway development. Um, these are some pictures of the surrounding context. Um, these are mainly the uh, Violet Crossing, which I believe actually has a new name now, but um, I'm going by the planning name. Um, Violet Crossing development shown there at the corner of Broadway and Violet. Um, to the right is the um, kind of northern portion of the Violet Crossing leading to the Uptown Broadway buildings, which are 48 feet in height. Um, and the bottom right picture is of a home in the Crestview West neighborhood across Broadway to the east. Um, the 4401 Broadway site, which recently underwent concept review, um, lies immediately to the north of, of the townhome site and is currently split zone between RM1 and MU3. And the new Novo Branch Library site sits just north of Violet Crossing on the east side of Broadway, as I just mentioned. Um, so in terms of the existing site review approval, under the existing approval, uh, the school buildings lying to the west of the residential portion of the site have been designed to include a mix of roof forms 
Uh, the approved building designs are compliant with RL2 height standards. These are images of uh, two of the approved school buildings. Um, this is a shot of the townhome lot and the uh, high school, which is currently under construction. Um, so within the approved locust neighborhood design guidelines, the applicant has provided an area analysis that included observations to provide a foundation for the guidelines, including use of porches and garages that are set back, a mix of architectural styles, but with a consistent style in each building, uh, variation in materials and sustainable landscaping with native species. These images are um, of the approved building height of the townhomes. These images are actually consistent with a tech doc application that the applicant has in currently. So we have determined that these buildings are consistent with the approved design guidelines. Um, so these are not approved yet, but these are uh, very likely what would be built um, at the buy right height if uh, the tech doc is approved. Um, these are also some images from the approved design guidelines. Um, they provide a list of acceptable primary and trim materials, roof styles, window, door, and entry details to fit within the neighborhood, um, but still remain elements of the time, still retain, sorry. So the proposed project, um, as mentioned previously, um, they are requesting, are proposing essentially two alternatives with um, the first being the preferred alternative, which is a seven and a half foot height increase to allow for sloped roofs on the third story. Those are shown on the uh, uppermost image there. Um, the second alternative is a four foot height increase uh, maintaining flat roofs. And that's really just to get uh, above the flood elevation. Uh, oh, sorry, no other changes to the previously approved design guidelines are proposed. Um, per the applicant's written statement, uh, upon further development and design of the townhome lot, it has been determined that the height of the townhomes is unduly constrained by the 100 year base flood elevation requirements. Uh, further, the applicant is interested in providing a sloped roof design that would provide more articulated roof lines that are more consistent with the surrounding residential neighborhoods and school architecture adjacent to the townhome site. Uh, therefore, the applicant is requesting additional height as allowable by uh, BRC section 9214B1EI. Um, and so this is for the first alternative is that the eligibility um, requirement is that the height modification is to allow for a roof that has a pitch of 212 or greater in a building with three or fewer stories and the proposed height does not exceed the maximum height permitted in the zoning district by more than 10 feet. So these images um, that you're currently seeing are the buildings at the approved 35 foot height. And these are overlaid with the request for um, the sloped roofs at seven and a half foot height increase. These next images um, will demonstrate the second alternative design which is intended to comply with section 9214B1E4, uh, which allows for a height modification request to allow up to the greater of two stories or the maximum number of stories permitted, but no more than five feet above the maximum building height in a building where the height modification is necessary because the building has to be elevated to meet the required flood protection elevation. Um, what these will show is that while the overall increase in height would be less in this scenario, four feet as opposed to seven and a half, it would not allow for sloped roof forms and would therefore actually have a more massive appearance from the street level as the entire four feet of extra height would extend vertically as opposed to the slope roofs, which would slope back beginning at the 35 foot mark. Morph, okay. Um, so that brings us to key issues. And key issue number one is, is the proposed project consistent with the site review criteria of the land use code including the additional criteria for buildings requiring height modification. And key issue number two is open for any other key issues um, that the board may identify. Okay, thank you. Um, are there questions right now for Chandler? Go ahead and then Laura, did you have a question? All right, this Kurt, you first then Laura. Uh, first of all, this is considered one building with a single low point, is that correct? Um, no. Individual units, they're attached by firewalls, but they each have uh, their own low points. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And will they then be stepped? Because it didn't appear that way in the rendering. Um, I don't know if the finished floor, 
elevation is consistent throughout all the buildings or step. I might defer to the applicant on that one. Okay. And can you also uh, take down key issue one so we can see George? Sure. I did have um, some staff findings to read about key issue one, but if you if you don't want me to read the staff findings, that's fine. Uh, no, go ahead and read the staff findings, and but then put George back up on. So because okay, otherwise I can't see if he's raising his hand. <laughs> sure. Um, so the staff findings for option one, uh, we found that the height modification is eligible. It's it's to allow a roof pitch that has a pitch of two twelve or greater. It's fewer than ten feet. Uh, fewer than three or three or fewer stories. Um, option two, they're also eligible to request um, because it's below five feet and uh, is necessary because the building has to be elevated to meet required flood protection elevation. Um, staff further found that the sloped roof design is compatible with the character of the surrounding area, that it avoids or minimizes blocking and prominent public views and contributes to a city skyline that has a variety of roof forms and heights. Uh, we also found that it maintains the existing architectural compatibility achieved by the approved design guidelines in terms of street level form and materials along the Broadway corridor north of Violet. Uh, the addition of sloped roof forms achieves greater compatibility with the single family residential character of the neighborhoods east of Broadway, as well as the adjacent school buildings, which incorporate a variety of roof forms, including gabled roofs. Um, and that overall, the proposal to allow for 42 and a half foot townhome buildings with sloped roofs would provide both a transition and scale to the more traditional residential areas to the south and southeast of the site, as well as more variety in the overall roof forms and architectural style of the area. So that's, that's it. Thanks. Okay, and just really quickly on um, board member Nordbeck's question. So uh, for a flood, there is a single flood protection elevation for each building, um, not each individual unit different than the purposes of calculating building height, but for the purposes of flood, um, so there won't be steps in the finished floor elevation. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Can I keep going? Okay, and then uh, the, the well, what, what, is the, what is the net elevation due to flood? If, if this were not in the 100 year floodplain, how much different would the, with the base elevation, I guess, be? Um, I believe five and a half feet, but I can also defer to the applicant to specify on that one. Okay. The applicant's going to make a uh, presentation. Yeah. And then the final question is a, really a process question, maybe for Hella. So there are these criteria for these two different options in the site review criteria, but this is considered, we're, we're, we're we're thinking of this basically as a new site review um, application, right? In other words, it needs to meet the full site review criteria under with consideration of these options. Is that accurate? In other yeah. words, we're not just thinking about whether it meets these two particular points. Yeah, the, the an entire proposal um, would have to meet the site review criteria. One of the things to consider, and as you think about that, there is already an approval um, for what's approved today. So the applicant can move forward with that, even if these changes are not being proposed. But overall, the entire project has to meet the site review criteria. So we're thinking about this as if this were a new proposal, but of course, the, the original proposal is already out there and approved. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Uh, Laura. Yeah, and the, the two criteria that I read, just to be clear, are um, they're just eligibility criteria. So just in, in order to even be eligible to ask for height modification. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my question is the, the modification because of the base flood elevation, was that not known when we had the original site review? Um, I guess it usually is already part of the site review proposal. So what I'm not understanding why this is a new ask. Was it not considered when they gave us their original design? I think it was known, um, but according to the applicant's written statement, which I'm sure they'll elaborate on, um, I think that it did the impacts to the interiors of the building didn't really become fully clear until they got into the design phase of the buildings. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to George and I'll come to you guys. Go ahead, Thanks. George. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I, I need my uh, memory refreshed, and I think some board members weren't on the board when we saw this in concept review relative to um, 
the 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 discrepancy between the two story and three story and what was actually allowed initially at this site could you could you could you just provide a quick refresher on on what that what that issue was it'd be helpful i don't actually know because i was not here when that concept <laughs> review came um i'm not sure that i recall any reading anything about a um discrepancy between two and three stories well there was a conversation because i was here too there was a conversation about the town homes being two stories uh and i actually remember george talking about um it, that would be okay because they might be more affordable because they wouldn't be quite so big but um because it was houses and town homes and there was a question about whether they should do both and um, but I don't remember exactly what the code was that it, people were referring what, to. What I recall, and and, and again, my, my memory is kind of fuzzy on this. I need to go back and, and really look at, I think we should look at our notes on that because what I recall is, is that they were permitted to go to 35 feet. However, um, it was pretty clear that they were only permitted, uh, there was an agreement in place. They were only permitted to do two stories. And we went back and forth through this process. Um, and... And again, my memory is fuzzy, so have the applicant or in the city, if, if if someone from the city that was there can can talk to this, I think that would be super helpful because this was a uh, this was a point of contention on this project with the neighbors and with us as a planning board. Um, there was an agreement in place that they were only permitted two stories, and then the applicant had mentioned that they wanted to do roof decks on this, and they needed a pop up to a third story in order to do that. That that's what I recall. I could be wrong on that. Um, and that ultimately they were going to stay within that 35 foot envelope. And this is why I'm bringing it up because I feel like to a certain extent, this is becoming scope creep. If, you know, they were originally allowed two stories and up to 35 feet and now, and, and they were okay with that at, with, with the third story, um, to this 35 foot limit. Now the applicant's coming in for an additional seven feet, four to seven feet, depending on what's happened. So I, I'd be, I'd, I would love for us to rewind the tape as the city because I think this is a material issue because of that discussion and because of the agreement that was in place at that time with the neighborhood. But again, I, I need I, I need um, clarity on that because I, I I don't have a good sense of it. It's really wild. Can, can I yeah, ask no, George uh, what no. he meant by something? I didn't understand what George said. I just wanted to ask. Yeah said they needed they were going to have two stories and they needed a pop up to the third story to have rooftop access i'm not sure i understand what yeah and, and you were there so so i could be i could be wrong um but what i recall I I was, was there. there there was I think that's th there was a requirement for only two stories but they had up to 35 feet which is what the discrepancy was and the applicant was saying that they wanted rooftop decks and they wanted this third story component for access to open air and things like that. And, and to Sarah's point, I remember my comments being, my concern was by, by adding this third story, we were, we were, we were tacking on, we, we were reducing ultimate the ultimate affordability of townhomes like this. But um that was it. I, I think it was, I think it was unanimous or pretty close to that. I don't remember if I voted yes or no at the ultimate, but but it was definitely ultimately decided that they were that we would allow this third story, even though in the agreement. Um, that they had in place, it was only two stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I recall, Laura, but I, I, I'm not 100, I don't know if you have a different recollection of that. I don't think she was here. I don't think I was there. Oh, for you the, weren't, uh, yeah. Uh, site okay. review. And, and I think- We can elaborate yeah. a little bit more. There was an annexation agreement on the property where the townhouses um, were approved that limited construction to two stories. And as part of the proposal that came forward, um, the applicant asked for an amendment of that annexation agreement to eliminate that. And that was approved by city council at the time. So that restriction on the property no longer exists because it was removed. So your decision has to be based on the site review criteria that apply to the request. No, I. I, I think, thank you, Hella, for that clarification. I guess my point was is that it, around that the, around that three stories that that we had that and and we had voted to approve on that too as the planning board, and it was 
they were still staying within that 35 foot envelope, um, which is that's that's my recollection. Anyways, I'll, I'll leave it there, but, but it would be helpful to, to understand a little bit more on that and maybe get a little bit more clarity on from the applicant. All right, um, ML. Oh, I don't have any no questions. questions. Mark? No. Okay. So um, if you guys wouldn't mind checking out uh, George's memory while the applicant makes their app, their presentation, that'd be great. Uh, and you will have uh, 15 minutes and you'll need to identify yourself. Well, that's great. No. Yeah. No, this was this was like three years ago. Yeah. No, he meant he meant site review. Hey Sarah, do we have any questions for you? Sarah and I need to get the next Sarah. Aaron and I need to get Uh good question. Um do we need to do any disclosures? Yeah, you should if if you have any disclosures. I believe we have a disclosure. <laughs> So I would like to disclose that Aaron Bagnall and I were together on the East Boulder Working Group, but I still believe I can be a fair quasi-judicial judge on this project. All right, um, and just because the, I just wanna double check, George can still see in here, right? Yeah, yeah I can, I can see everything, thank you. Because we can't see anything. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll speak up, if you can't see my hand, I'll speak up if I need to, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sounds great. All right, can you start start the clock? We started. Okay, not yet. Do you need ten or fifteen? Fifteen. Fifteen. Uh, good evening, Aaron Bagnall, partner at Sofer Sparn Architects in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this. Um, lots of good questions, and I think I have answers to all of them, so stay tuned. Um, what I wanted to do, obviously, height is a really sensitive thing in Boulder. We know this. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to go over this. I kind of stole this from Carl, actually, uh, a little bit of a history of height and what's happened in the past. So pre-1971, everyone knows there was no height limit. Um, in 1971, the city charter, decided that um, we needed to get a handle on the growth and those tall buildings, so we established this 55-foot height limit. Um, between that time and 2000, 2015 era, you were allowed to ask for um, height modifications through what used to be PUD, then became site review. Um, around 2015, uh, the city staff and the planning board and the city council they all kind of felt like the growth was getting a little um, away from them, for lack of a better word, and also felt like they needed to take a little pause and um, get a very important um, affordable housing change in the mix. So they put the height moratorium on, everybody knows about Appendix J, and um, sent city staff on a mission to do site review criteria updates. 
And the reason I'm bringing this up is that this is the reason why we're here today and we're able to ask for any of these two things that we're asking for. Um, in phase one, uh, Sarah, I believe you were maybe involved in this. Um, the uh, first phase of the site review criteria updates were um, mostly focused, obviously, around the affordable housing and adding that density and intensity bonus, um, making it more beneficial for affordable housing when people are given extra height. At the time, we also decided or agreed that there's a lot of box. The city of Boulder is set up for flat roofs. The land use code is set there. That's why we see so many flat roofs. So at that time, we put this roof slope exception in the code so that people could ask for that possibility. Um, I don't know if you've seen a lot of them come through, but I just thought I'd include that here. Um, the phase two site review criteria update um, included the floodplain exception because you know, as an applicant and um, as city staff, we see a lot of floodplain projects that are very much constrained by sometimes five to six, sometimes seven feet of height that you're already losing for floodplain protection elevations. So that's just a really brief history. And I think that this project is one of a perfect example of why we have this exception in the code. And I hope you do too by the time we get done with this. Um, could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so Chandler already said, had a very good graphic of this. This is kind of locating ourselves in, in, the, in the scene of North Boulder. And you know we are right south of the Bimoka project. The Shiny Mountain campus had a, has a 11 acre site, um, lots of residential around, lots of residential feel. And the village center for the um, North Boulder <coughs> sub-community is there and the North Boulder library that's under construction. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I, I put this in here, it, it might be a little bit hard to see, but that's kind of a good thing because what I see when I look at this photo is a lot of the development that was spurred by the North Boulder sub-community plan and all the flat roofs that we got out of it. And what I see in the Shining Mountain Waldorf, if we overlay what we have planned, is something that's of scale and in keeping with the neighborhood surrounding it. Uh, next slide, please. So I bring this up, there's two projects that I'm gonna bring up and they are, I have history with them. They're both Sophos Barn projects. They're both on Broadway and they both went through site review and asked for height um, exemption. So, and they're both two different projects. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So this is the Broadway Brownstones. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. If you're not, it's right just north of Ideal Market on the east side of Broadway. In site review, they had approved um, five and a half feet height modification. Uh, there's no flood restraint in this um, situation. They have two, much like the townhomes we're proposing, two story mass, third, uh, third story setback, flat roof. All right, can you invite to the next slide, please? Now just up north of that site is Washington Village, uh, Broadway building, also got five and a half feet height modification through site review no flood, um, pitched roof at third level. This building feels a lot different. It's two stories, third floor is stepped back substantially and it's all pitched roof. Um, so those are just some examples of how pitched roofs can change the dynamic on the street and from the way we see a building. Uh, next slide, please. So seven and a half feet, that feels like a big number and I get that. Um, it's not really, it's the ridge height. And so I'm, I'm putting this up there because it appears as though it's a lot, but just walk, let me walk you through this. So on the bottom, um, this is the approved height, 35 feet with a flat roof. The height is measured to the roof sheathing. You can have 18 inches of parapet. You can have mechanical on the roof and roof screening, not to say that we're going to do that, but all those things can come into play with, with um, outside of height modifications. Um, what we're asking for is seven and a half feet to a ridge line that's at the midpoint of the building. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is what it looks like from a street perspective. On the left, you see Locust Street with a pitched roof. Um, on the right, you see Locust Street with the flat roof. You can see that that roof plate height is where the 35 foot height is and everything else go, slopes up from there. 
So we're just going to kind of cycle through these and see the see the impact that it doesn't necessarily have that people are afraid of. Um, again, this is violet pitched roof. Um, in my opinion, this this the pitched roof and the sloped roof looks so much better as a designer, and um, I don't really I don't really see how. I hope that people can see what I see when we look at these um, renderings. So keep going. That's violet. If we keep going, broad along Broadway again, you're not seeing much of a difference. Oh, it, oh, you can see on this one. You see the gable end, but honestly, the gable end it it makes for a better better um, three dimensional feel. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, flood height. Kurt, I think you answered. Did you ask a question that you about flood that you had didn't get answered? Um, let me see if I can remember it. Okay, so I think it was the what would it what building elevation would you be at if it wasn't flood? Right. And I think we probably like it really just depends on grading, and so we probably lose three to four feet really for flood from the low point. Um, so this in blue, this is how much we're raising our building. There's a lot of um, very important infrastructure and grading and um, flood mitigation that's going on in, these, in this development that's going to help this area of town. Uh, what that means to us is that our datum line is lifted and we're already at a deficit when we start. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna bring this back. This is not gonna take too long, but we've been working with Shiny Mountain since 2015. Um, next slide, please. They, they've, they've been in the North Boulder area since 1986 when they purchased the property um, and, and moved their school here and um, really, 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 really wanted to stay in Boulder. Um, they knew it was gonna be hard. It has proven to be hard but they wanted to do it and they're, they're seeing it through. And part of the ways that we, part of the reason, next slide please, is because during the 2013 flood, they, they saw a lot of damage. They have a lot of, how, of buildings that are not even on great foundations and they really needed to bring their school up to, up to the flood protection standards for, um, for Boulder and make it safe. So we worked with them, next slide please. We worked with them for six years to, and the city and staff to, to formalize this master plan that would allow the school to stay in Boulder and use some of their land as the extension on the south, extension of the single family home neighborhood and along Broadway, um, the townhomes. And I, I'll just say as an aside, you know, we talk a lot about affordable housing. I, I'm a huge proponent of affordable housing. I work with BHP a lot. We tried oh, for a while and lost probably a year of the process to get the townhome site to be affordable housing, rezone and, and get affordable housing there. And it could, we can't, couldn't rezone and get the density that BHP would even want to take it or Element or any of the other people in town. So it was not for lack of trying. That's just an aside. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> So in keeping, with the, in keeping with the design of the entire campus, we have a, a residential feel, a long lasting materials, lots of masonry, wood tones that, um, and gable roofs that keep with the, the Waldorf pedagogy and also this neighborhood. This neighborhood is very eclectic. It's a lot of um, really interesting single family homes and we wanna be a part of that. Uh, next slide, please. So all of our, that was the lower school site. This is the high school, it's under construction if you've seen it. Um, hopefully you think it's great. I think it's amazing. And it has the gable roof um, as well. So for the townhomes, we're very much interested in keeping this, this vision or this neighborhood feel and um, which we're allowed to ask for through site review. And that's why we're here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, same materials, nice masonry materials, wood tones, something that's complementary, not exactly like the school, is what we we're going for with this design. Um, like Chandler says, we could have flat roofs. We, it, it, 
the tech docs are in, we could be fine. But we feel like this is an important thing to ask for because we feel like it's a better product. Um, this is the last slide I'll leave you with. Um, I think it's telling because in the foreground, we have a lot of flat roof, non-interesting buildings. Apologies to those that might be <laughs> listening to this that may have designed it, but that's no fault of theirs. Boulder, Boulder's land use code previously and um, hopefully no longer designs for flat roofs. Um, so there's a couple things to clarify. Um, why didn't we know this at the time of approval? So in regards to the sloped roofs, they, we didn't have a, we were only doing design guidelines. We did not have anybody to develop with us, at us being Shining Mountain Waldorf School. We didn't have COBOL as a joint venture. We wanted to create the design guidelines to the extent where we were formalizing as much as we needed to per staff recommendations. Um, and letting the rest be determined later. This is later. So it's not a scope creep. It's not bad intentions. It really is just like, this is the next phase of our project. Um, the flood was not in place at the time of approval. So that was approved more recently and we didn't know that we would be able to have that five foot height. Um, am I missing any questions? I guess I can't answer, ask any questions, but I hope that I answered all of your questions and I am happy to answer anything if you need to ask me again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Who has questions? Oh, go ahead, Kurt. Uh, what are the floor to ceiling heights that in the three, so there's, there's three different floors. So in yeah. each variation, there's three different or his ceiling height, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then are they the same across the three designs? Because I'm seeing the floor to floor heights changing, but it wasn't clear to me if the floor to ceiling heights are changing. Yes, the so in the in the approved height, the floor to floor heights are more, are tighter than desirable for townhome construction of of the type that we're doing with the, which is a deep floor plate and a, a wood trust floor that's 16 inches, then you have to account for steel and drop ceiling and soffits. So you leave a lot of flexibility in that floor to floor height if you can get it. But the question is what's the floor to ceiling? What are the floor well, to so ceiling heights? Sorry to answer your question. It differs from scheme to scheme because if we get extra height, we will use a little bit of fluff in the areas, mostly on the second and the third floor where we're constrained right now more than desirable. So in the current design, yes. what are the Sorry. three core? Uh, I need the, I can look right here, excuse me, sir. Yeah, maybe if you don't mind, um, I can tell you what slide it is, it's 11. Okay, so you can see here that the first level is 10 foot six from the second level. 10 foot from the second level to the third, and then uh, that dimension is taken to the roof. So that the third floor is more like 711 to the underside of the roof framing. So the first floor floor to ceiling height is 10 six? No, it's nine six as shown. But I will say that the these this floor assembly is um, a lot shallower than what the preferred method that we would prefer to use, which is those sixteen inch um, truss wood trusses. Okay, and then this. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing where these are. The second floor floor to ceiling is. Oh, on the inside, and then nine. Nine. nine there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And seven eleven. And seven eleven. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. 
Um, I... Thank you. I just wanted to ask Aaron to clarify when you said the flood wasn't available when you came in for site review, you mean that criterion in the site review criteria that allows you to ask for five extra feet? Correct. If you have to elevate above the base flood elevation. Okay, thank you. George, you had your hand up. Did you take it back down? Oh, yeah, I did have a question and it goes back to Kurt's because I don't know if that was answered by the applicant. I thought it was a really interesting one because it, can you can you um, in the presentation that you showed us, will you go back to the elevations of the facade of the building? Not not the not not that kind of three dimensional one, but the, the 2D elevation. It was near the beginning of the presentation. It was where you had the lines. That one. Yeah, that one. So I thought Kurt's question was really interesting because I see the slope of the land and I see the building as one continuous building rather than different low points um, on that lower south elevation that you're showing and the upper south elevation. Can you can you talk about that? Because if we're if we're building to low points, wouldn't the building itself articulate? I'm going to each townhouse unit. So, so the to the answer, the each townhouse unit cannot. We're not varying. So Chandler was correct. Each one of these, per the city's method of measuring height, can be its can have its own low point. But as Charles mentioned, the there can only be one fin of uh, flood protection elevation for each building. And as in a, in regards to FEMA, they they treat each of these groupings of townhomes as one building. So because of FEMA, we cannot step. Got it, that's that's super helpful. Thanks for explaining that. Emil, do you have questions? Yes, um, <clears throat> on that same topic, there was a slide that showed sort of that blue water <laughs> that showed the flood impact it was again up an elevation section. Yes. Um, so there would be a, a difference here, right? Between the idea of the low point being 25 feet away. Mm -hmm. That's not a FEMA thing. It's not. Um, so the FEMA uh, requirement is how many feet above the grade at the site. Um, I, think it's I can give you. I can give you an estimate there. So FEMA is separate completely from the way that the city measures right. height, and they have. Um, I don't know what they call them, but they're they're like streaks across your the the land in a hundred year floodplain, and they give you that elevation. And whatever that elevation is around your building, you have to go either one foot or two foot above that flood protection elevation, or sorry, base flood elevation is what it's called. And so we have a base flood elevation for this building and it is exactly two feet below the flood protection elevation that we're showing there. Okay, that so sense? directly impact by flood that the, that the building's height is um, related to our two, is two feet, is that correct? Two feet, yeah, okay. two feet from, from a base flood elevation that which is completely separate from existing grade or whatever it might be. It's, it's, it's not correlated but, but, all the time. You know, it's, it's an important thing because you're mm -hmm. referencing that as a factor okay. at the flood. So we're talking about two feet here. Mm -hmm. um, so my other question is kind of like what Kurt was talking about as well, which, so right now the first and second floor are, those are substantial floor to ceiling heights, over nine feet or nine feet. The top floor, you even call it a loft, so you don't call it a third floor because it's just, just barely eight feet. Getting more height than that probably could just be a third floor and not necessarily a loft, which would make it um, in a, in a it'd make it be more marketable. Right now, I see the biggest impact height-wise is taken out in that in that third floor. Mm -hmm. We've got it down at seven eleven. Yes, and we have what's not shown here is a sloped portion in between the flat section 
that separates the two units. If we go back to the elevation, I can show you, but that's a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're calling it a loft? Is because of We're calling it a loft because it's a small space. Oh, okay. It's not because of the ceiling height? No. So a higher or lower ceiling height wouldn't really matter. No, and, I, and you know, like a lot of, I, I get, I, I, I want to just respond, I guess, I, can I respond to George's Scope Creek creep question? Sure. Um, there, this isn't going to change the costs of these townhomes. We're not adding any square footage. That we're just trying to improve design. So my last question is, um, and I'm quoting out of the applicant's information. Right? <clears throat> so you cite... Um, the two-dimensional impact versus when taken at a pedestrian scale from a three-dimensional view, the requested changes are not discernible. Mm -hmm. And I think you kind of used that language when you were doing your presentation. Mm -hmm. Yet you also claim that the desire to provide slope roof area on the buildings for design aesthetic are the determining factors. So on the one hand, nobody's going to notice is what you're saying with the first statement. And on the second statement, you're saying fact that they're sloped is is why we want to do this mm -hmm. but yet nobody's noticing so can you explain that sure yeah it, it goes back to you know we we have um a lot of trails above here it's why i showed the book the, the bird's eye um it's not just from it's not discernible from the pedestrian scale when you're on the street so when you're in front of when you're walking down these streets you will not know if that if i ever got this height exemption one way or the other but when you're removed and you're coming down Broadway one way or the next way, or you're coming down Locus, or after dropping your kid off at soccer, um, you'll see it and it, it'll be noticeable. And when you're up on the mountain and you're hiking, or if you're parasailing or whatever those things are, <laughs> it's, that will be discernible. So I didn't mean to contradict myself in that way, but I was just trying to point out that it's, um, it's, I feel like it's less offensive than the numbers say. So the long view versus the close view is what you're yeah. saying. Sure. Thank you so much for your answers. Mm -hmm. Those are my questions. Can Mark, I do a follow up to something you else said? Sure. Thank you. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding what you were saying about the base flood elevation and the two feet versus five feet. Mm -hmm. That, that two feet is two feet above a projected flood, right? So that's like, if there were a 100 year flood, that's the level the water would be at. That's not about the ground surface. Correct. So you actually have to elevate the building five feet above where the actual ground is. Is that what I'm hearing? In this case, yes. In this case, okay. Five feet above, five and a half feet above a low point. Five and a half feet above the low point. And so the anticipation is that if there were that hundred year flood and the water rose to that base flood elevation, the building would be two feet out of the water. Correct. And that's where that two feet comes from. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. You. And that, that's why I was trying to say that the, the base flood isn't really, it doesn't correlate to anything that exists on the surface right now. It's again, the, what the base flood could rise to the, what the flood could rise to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But you are actually taking the building up five and a half feet from the ground level of where you thought the ground was going to be when you proposed. Yeah. It, the, it puts us at a deficit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the height, in the way that we calculate height. Okay. Thank you. Mark. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have yet another follow up to Laura's follow up. Um, so I had asked staff what they estimated the net elevation required as a result the, of the fact that this is in the 100, 100 year floodplain mm -hmm. was. And their estimate was three to four feet, which is less than the five and a half. Do you agree with the three to four feet? In other words, if FEMA tomorrow were to revise their flood maps and say, mm -hmm. oh, we were wrong, sorry, my bad. Mm -hmm. This was not in the floodplain. You could lower the building by how much from where you are now? I think, I mean, I would say four is a good estimate to say, you know, you don't wanna be at your low point when you build a building, you're gonna slope up and grade away from the structure. So we'll call it four. Thank you. All right, last opportunity for questions for Aaron. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now is an opportunity for public comment on the, or public input. Do we have anyone in the room 
No, I don't think we're online. Okay. Vivian, you're muted somehow. Can you hear me now? No? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, we have one hand online. Anybody in the room? No. Okay. And um, then we'll just go to the one online participant. That's Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you have three minutes to speak to this item. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think that you should just set up what the criteria for the height limitations are going to be with sloped roofs um, and set it at that. So you don't have to like be offering things to people to get them to put in pitched roofs. Just, for example, if the if the pitched roof it, um, takes up a certain amount of area, it should also be lower that the ceiling there would have to be lower. And I didn't see that on those images. I saw that it was up and then the pitched roof rises above that. And I say no. Um, so that there isn't this debate over, over these issues, it should just be set in stone what you want. And if you have to, and, and if we want our built environment to have pitched roofs, then it has to have pitched roofs, but they are, they're going to have to make up for that area with being a little lower to account for the pitch being higher. Um, and the other thing, flood issues are, are, you know, here in Boulder. And why are we giving benefits for people to, you know, why do they have to raise things up why don't they just have a you know a smaller building um and n not have these basically kind of subsidies just for the floods because of the flood um because the benefit to the community is not better for getting a, a third level when there should be two um the benefit should be basic and the developer has to meet to it and if they don't they don't then there isn't a question of oh we're going to let them put in pitch roof we're going to have them give them a, a a flood benefit no they have to meet the flood benefit from the start um because there's all of this extra expense added on and then also, um, I wanted to agree with Will that there should be um, some industrial areas there that have been beneficial to the community and that he, he didn't know about or how, how he's supposed to deal with that. We don't have enough industrial space that's preserved in Boulder in our central areas. And primarily we need the jobs housing balance to be balanced. Thank, thank you, Lynn. That's your first. three minutes. First. Thank you for being here. Okay, okay. Chair, there are no other hands raised right. from thank the you. online participants. Thank right. you. Um, so why don't we do this first? Chandler, can you just pull up uh, the motion that you're recommending to us just so that we see it and then we'll take it back down so we can see George and then we'll have our discussion. Thanks. All right, so this is the suggested motion, um, which may prompt a couple of questions uh, regarding how we might respond to it, but um, we won't read it yet because I just want us to have an opportunity to talk amongst ourselves about this. If you don't mind taking that down so we can see George. Okay, are there comments, questions, discussion folks wanna have? about this. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, George. I, I actually thought that <clears throat> going back to our public comment for a second, I, I thought that Lynn made a really good suggestion because this feels like a discretionary matter that we should be able to solve by code at some point. Um, so something to for us to pin as a, as a board outside of this decision. Um, 
I, I don't have other comments at this point on on this. Thank you. Okay. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, you know, so the, the way that I'm thinking about this is there's an approved site review, right? We approved a building design and we are just here to consider the applicant has pointed to two code sections, some of which are fairly new that could give them additional height and staff have determined that they're eligible for that additional height. So for me, the question is going to what Kurt said, if we grant this request, which they are eligible for, does it still meet the site review criteria? And, and probably particularly that's compatibility, I would think, compatibility with the rest of the neighborhood. So that's where my focus is, um, is not do we like pitched roofs or not, but you know they're eligible for that. We have put in our code that we want to encourage that and allow additional height to get that, right? So we have a, um, a buy right height, and then we did put into the code, hey, we'll give you a little extra height above the buy right if you'll give us a pitched roof as a way to incentivize the pitched roof. So I'm inclined to consider that and whether it is compatible with the rest of the neighborhood. And I think everybody who has participated in previous site reviews for, with me knows that I generally think that going up one floor is fine, is compatible with the neighborhood. So I'm not opposed to three stories. And you know, I do think five feet for flood elevation is completely reasonable, right? We, we want safety, we want building safety, we want public safety. And so on that score, I'm not opposed to additional five feet. And then if we go an additional two feet above that or two and a half feet above that to get a pitched roof, to me, that's perfectly reasonable. So I would go with the applicant's proposal to um, allow the pitched roofs at the seven and a half feet. But I'm wanting to hear what, how other people are thinking about it. All right, I see that George has his hand up and then I'll come back around. Go ahead, George. Sorry, that was a, a remnant. Okay. Uh, Mark, did you? Um, <clears throat> I concur with Laura. And, and taking into account that this was not a, some sort of minor site review. This, this was a site review that was a substantial site review that went through a lot of public process. Council called it up, council approved it, and council approved the, um, the decision to change the code to allow the additional height for pitched road. So that, that is a, uh, not just a planning board or staff decision. That's a, that's a policy that was uh, directly approved by council. So I concur with Laura and um, I, I'll, I'll, I'm, whenever we're done with this discussion, I've got a motion modified to eliminate the flat roof option because what we're really discussing is the both the aesthetic benefits and I think the um, the aesthetic benefits and the allowance for a pitched roof. And so I think our I would suggest that our discussion should be focused on that and not the combination of uh, pitched and flat. Yeah, uh, I think as Laura pointed out, a lot of this comes down to how we're coming at this. And I agree with your analysis that we do, it's clear that from the code that this project is eligible for these height modifications. And the question, as you pointed, put it was, is that then consistent with the, um, with the rest of the site review criteria, including the BBCP? And the, uh, I think com com neighborhood compatibility is one question. I am also thinking though about uh, housing affordability, uh, which is a, certainly a goal in the Boulder Valley comp plan. And the applicant stated that they were not applying for this because it would benefit the, the value of the property. But <clears throat> with all due respect, I'm a little bit skeptical of that um, because seems like an awful lot of work to go through for just something that would look better, I guess, um, in when they're pitching the next project or something like that. Or, I mean, maybe Shining Mountain um, just wants to have a nicer neighborhood, and I'm sure that they do. But I, I find it a little bit difficult to believe that the these higher ceiling, floor to ceiling heights would not generate uh, a higher value for the properties. 
And so that is my, certainly one of my greatest concerns about approving this. Emil, do you have a comment you want to make? Oh, not, not at the moment. Okay. Um, all right. I have a question, which is a follow up to uh, Mark's comment. Uh, is there a staff rationale for a motion that includes both? Is there still an ongoing discussion between staff and the applicant? Um, no, the idea was, so the applicant only intends to build one design. So we included both just because it was the easiest way to include the two alternative. And then they can make up their motion. own, they can make up their mind what they want. I mean, they, they want to do the thing. So if we approve what's written, they'll just not preventing them from doing it. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we should make the motion. And I think Mark, it probably sounds like we don't need to change it. I, I just emailed it to Amanda and Thomas and I have it here. Uh, so we can put it up on the screen. Oh. We can put it up on the screen, but it, I, in essence, just took out the words al allowing the or uh, alternative. So I move to approve site review application number LUR 2023-00050, including a height modification request to allow for up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof for each townhome building within the approved Shining Mountain Waldorf School Development, adopting the staff memorandum as findings of fact, including the attached analysis of review criteria and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. All right, any comment before we say? Oh, second. We have a lawyer, we have a lawyer question. Um, Chandra and I were struggling with the alternative proposal when we were proposing motion language and conditions and the way it's set up, um, the conditions of approval actually also address both alternatives. So if you're acting on only one, then that should be modified as well. And I guess I, I assume you are interpreting the application as the request for the the four foot height modification based on flat reasons is only in front of us if the request for the peaked roof height modification is not approved and that the applicant doesn't expect you to act on that second request if the first one is approved. And if that's the case, then I would like the applicant to confirm that. Otherwise, I think you need to act on both. And if you only find one to meet the criteria, then um, then we would actually have to make denial findings for the other one. I'd like to suggest, I, I'm, I would like to suggest that we actually vote on what was proposed. It changes nothing, but allows the process to go forward. Um, the applicant's going to do what the applicant's going to do, <clears throat> and uh, which we believe is the peaked roof if, if it gets approved. And I don't think changing it, changing it for the sake of absenting one option uh, is um, a meaningful change. That's just my thought. Can I, can I ask a question real quick? Just to clarify, Hella, I think I heard you say that, or maybe I'm interpreting what you said. We don't get to pick and say, we like this alternative better than that alternative. We have to say, based on the merits, do we think that they meet the criteria for option A? And do we think that they meet the criteria for option B? And if we weren't going to allow the, the intermediate option, we'd have to deny it and say, here's why it doesn't meet the criteria. That's my recommendation, unless we get clear direction from the applicant that essentially they, they only want one option to be in front of you and not even consider the other one if the first one is approved. Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, and, and even then you have, we have to, do we really do things that way here where the applicant gets to decide while we're here in well, in, in other words, they would do a we could have the applicant do a clear withdrawal of the second option, so you don't have to make any decision on that. Well, but, but I, I want to, I'd like to, since I have the motion out there, I'd like to speak to that. If we, if the applicant, I, I understand the legal ramifications of, um. On one hand, we modify, the board modifies motions all the time and restricts or conditions them. 
So this motion is to approve a specific height exception for a specific design. That is exactly what the applicant has presented us with. The applicant did not discuss or present us with the benefits alternatives of the flat design. If we, if we, if there is a, if there is a motion, if this motion does not get a second and is, or is hell on your advice is not applicable or we shouldn't do it, then I, I, I would, uh, be reluctant. I don't feel like we've done an evaluation of a flat roof design and had a presentation from the applicant uh, regarding a, a flat roof design. So if we're allowing a flat roof design and a height exemption for that flat roof design, but don't actually want it, don't actually desire it, think it's bad, we don't know because we, we really haven't been presented with it as an option. So that's why I'm restricting my motion to the option as presented. So I think in this case, sir, I understand your concern about letting applicants modify things, but I think that uh, in this case, in the moment, uh, maybe hearing from the applicant would be the most expeditious thing to do. Yeah, I, I think it would be um, good to check in with the applicant because it was phrased in the alternative. So I think it can be interpreted as that, but I would want that very clear on the record. Um, and I did want to point out that even if the presentation focused mostly on the peak drops, the application is for both and, um, and there are images presented and so forth for both options. Can I just comment on that? They have an approved site review for a flat roof design. So they're just talking about taking the thing that we already approved and elevating it above base flood elevation, which is allowed in the code. So we'd have to argue why it's not uh, acceptable or doesn't, in our opinion, meet the criteria to take the design they already have and lift it up above the base flood elevation. So to me, that's I don't think they need to re-argue a, a design that we've already approved that they just want to elevate. So why don't we do this? Uh, is there a second to his motion? <laughs> okay. All right, that solves that problem. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, would you like to make the other motion? Sure. Okay, <laughs> could you please put up the original motion so it can be, we can make a motion. Someone, yeah, there it goes. Okay. <sighs> It's up on the screen. Oh. Yeah. It's okay. I, I've got it. I move to approve site review application number LUR 2023-00050, including a height modification request to allow for up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof, or alternatively, up to four feet of additional height with or without a pitched roof for each townhome building within the approved Shining Mountain Waldorf School Development, adopting the staff memorandum as findings of fact, including the attached analysis for review criteria and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Thank you. Do we have a second? I will second. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thought we might not have a second there. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark. Yeah, this is this is pretty easy for me, given, uh, as I said before, given uh, the uh, the intent of, of our whole um, 2015 through 2019, the height moratorium, all of the community input that went into this, uh, that we uh, want to allow modifications that allow for additional density. We wanna allow for modifications that uh, uh, create um, the varied design. And uh, I think this certainly falls within the code and the parameters of the code and that this is a, uh, a clear case uh, that where we should grant the, uh, the request. Is that an I? Oh, are you voting a 
I, I'm sorry. I this was we were, we no. were speaking to the motion. Excuse me. We can speak. Would, would okay. people like to vote or speak to the motion? I, we'd like to vote. Okay. okay. No, no, no. Oh, no, we'd no, like no. to speak to the motion. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, I I actually uh, would like to propose. Oh, sorry. I would like to propose an amendment. And the amendment is to strike the words. Um, to strike the words up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof or alternatively, comma. So this motion would be to strike the first alternative, the pitched roof alternative, and leave only the elevated flat roof alternative. The reason for this, if I can speak to this, is that I feel like uh, because the, in my understanding, the flood maps got issued at, subsequent to all this approval and design. And so I think there's absolutely justification for accommodating that, for taking into consideration the fact that now all of a sudden there's flood uh, to deal with and that so uh, elevating based on that I think is appropriate. To me, there is very little justification for the pitched roof other than possibly greater maintainability. I think that from a visibility standpoint, it is, as the, the applicant stated, the, the visibility ramifications are minimal when you're nearby and not that many people are paragliding uh, <laughs> and looking at it from above. And so, I mean, the, 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 there was, we were shown a picture of the holiday area, which is all flat roofs and I really had no idea that those were flat roofs because I've never seen them from that viewpoint before. So I think that the second, uh, the, the, the flat roof, the second option, the flat roof, elevated flat roof option is entirely justified. I do not find the first option to be justified. All right, so you're the uh, maker of the motion. Do you accept that? Is, am I doing this right? He has to accept the- No, he would need a second for his, he's, he's made a motion to amend and he would need a second for that. I'll second that. Okay. Comments on the amendment? Yes, sir. So um, in essence, you are uh, advocating for a flat roof design because you, you and again, I, I, when I understand it, you're advocating for a flat roof design in spite of the fact that you said that the visuals, um, from the street will be minimal. So what would be the advantage of a flat roof design over a pitch roof design? Well, I think the way, my understanding is the way we need to evaluate it, this is, is there benefit to the pitched roof design basically in or such that it would justify the height exemption? And to me, there is no, appreciable benefit to the pitched roof design. And if the, basically if the pitched roof design does not meet the BVCP and the site review criteria, then it should be denied. And so in my viewpoint, that that does not, the, 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 the pitched roof approach with the, or the additional height in order to get the pitched roof does not meet the site review criteria. Okay, does a pitched roof, is a pitched roof advantageous according to the current code and allowed an exemption? Do we allow exemptions based on our, uh, the city stated preference in the code for a pitched roof? Yes, I believe so. I mean, that's what the exemption is based on. Right, right. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. You want to yeah. clear on that. But okay. but that's why I was asking, I, I believe we're, we're judging this, not just that sole part, but the entire application on the site review criteria, including the BBCP mm -hmm. and so on. And so viewed in total, the way I judge it, that does not meet the site review criteria. 
All right, so ML and then Laura. Um, so Kurt, I, I seconded what you had to say because the four foot of additional height, it includes with or without a pitched roof. So you could put a pitched roof in with an additional foot we saw, right? Right now that height is 711 in, uh, on that top floor. Can you pitch those top floors by design? Absolutely. So I don't think this is a, a, a vote for, we're gonna go with flat roofs if we, if we grant the flood um, exemption, the flood height. I think that this is, is just a matter of, sure, you can have a, if, if it's as important as um, was described in the design, the long, the big view, you wanna see pitched roofs, you can get a pitched roof in now, but we're gonna add the four feet is what it's what they've asked for. Um, and it does say four feet of additional height with or without a pitched roof. So we're not precluding a pitched roof. In fact, we're just saying the, the criteria that has, that is, Coming forth with the most weight is the criteria of the floodplain and the impact that that's having. So that's why I was interested in seconding um, Kurt's motion. If if I may, if I may speak to that, I wanted to clarify that the determinations of whether a height modification is possible is kind of a gateway determination. And if it is, then the site review criteria are, have to be reviewed and the decision has to be based on that. And for the pitched roof, the gateway question really is, is proposed, is something proposed that includes a two to 12 or greater pitch with three or fewer stories. And the proposed height does not exceed the maximum height otherwise permitted by more than 10 feet. That's not actually a discretionary decision. So they meet that gateway determination. So for this request, you now have to look at whether or not the site review criteria are met. So your discussion on the pitched roof request should really focus on the site review criteria and, and not be a comparison to the two options that's, that are being proposed. Uh, so Laura, and then I wanna come back to what Hal was saying. Yeah, so I, I was going pretty much the same place. It sounds like we are all, at least there are four of us who would vote for the second option and say, yes, they meet that criterion. And we think it's compatible with the site review criteria. There are at least four of us who are okay with the four feet of additional height is I think what I'm hearing. And then, so that's one question. And then the question is, all right, so for the extra three feet that they're asking for because of this pitched roof criterion, which is a separate criterion, we have to look at the site review criteria and say, Yes, of course, they are eligible for it. As Hella just said, that's not discretionary. They are eligible. Now we have to say, if we grant it, does it meet the site review criteria? And if we don't grant it, we have to say how it does not meet the site review criteria. And so I was going to ask Kurt to specify what exactly in the site review criteria you think it would not meet. You know, is it the balance of the BVCP policies? Is it some other specific thing in the site review criteria? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. And it is primarily um, the, it's the BVCP uh, policies that I was looking at. Again, as, as I'd stated before, it's in my judgment, it's the affordability, the, the housing affordability criterion. Um, I don't have my note up, whatever, um, don't have the number. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, so I, I would leave it at that, the housing, so, housing affordability criterion. So the, the, the site review criterion, I think, Hella, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have related to the BVCP policies, including affordability, is on balance, does it meet the BVCP goals and objectives? And we added something in the last site review criteria update to say that it can't just be one policy because no no development is held to every single thing in the BBCP because that's like the Bible, right? It has everything in there that you could possibly look for. So we would have to say on balance, this is not advancing the BBCP goals and objectives. And are you comfortable making that finding? Yeah, and, and I guess I, I should have 
you're, you're absolutely right. And I should have been clear to me that is the, the Delta, I guess that's the one that changes is prim primarily, or, or there, there were actually a couple of, um, of housing affordability criteria. And those are the ones that, that I, I guess I would judge to be less met under the seven foot six inch additional height for sloped roof criterion. And to me, that is enough to determine that it does not meet the site review criteria in that case. I guess another way to put it would be if the applicant had initially come in with a request for a seven foot six additional height with pitched roof a request, basically using this exemption, would I, in, in considering this, have wanted to strike that and you know basically not approve that exemption and i think that the answer would be yes so that's another way that i would think about it whether i'm thinking about it correctly i'm not certain but hopefully i am uh, go ahead um just speaking to the boulder valley comp plan i think that the um, neighborhood compatibility we heard a lot of input from the neighbors um, regarding uh, their concern about the added height. Um, and I think that that is uh, something that should come to play, that the people who actually live there and have lived there um, are concerned about the added height. And I think that the Boulder Valley Comp Plan does put out the values of existing neighborhoods and um, helping retain the qualities that those neighborhoods have and who better to speak for them than the actual neighbors. So I think that that's a criteria to keep in mind as well. Mark? I, I would, um, ML, and just uh, not to make my, I'll make my other point, but I, um, I would disagree with that in the sense that site review criteria is something that it is site review criteria and and neighbors need to be able to voice do they do they think the project meets the site review criteria but just opposition mm -hmm. for the sake of we have lots of opposition to lots of projects for the sake of opposition for projects that meet site review criteria so so the bbc or the bbcp for that matter I, I, my question is for Hella. I, the way I read, which we don't have the wording just yet, on Kurt's amendment would be that it was, it's a modification of the applicant's request, which um, seemed, my modification seemed to be shot down as being something that that the applicant has a, has applied for this based on the language in the suggested motion and that my modification was deemed not to be advised legally. So I'm not sure why Kurt's modification would not fall into exactly the same uh, criteria. Yeah, I think I think that the application could be interpreted, and I again I would want to have the applicant confirm that that their primary request is for the peak roof modification, and if that's not passed, the second request based on flood for additional four feet of height. But Kurt's proposed motion um, addresses doesn't address that a part of the request essentially, so you would have to address that as well. Um, it, it seems like what you're proposing is a partial approval, partial denial, essentially. So I'm sorry. So it's, we're right back where we were with Mark's. Yeah. Okay. Can I make a process suggestion? Sure. Hey, Chandler, could you put back up those two 
um, pieces of the code that talk about eligibility for the different height modifications, the one for flood and the one for peaked roof. Yes. I just suggest that we talk through those independently. Do we think that option one is supported based on the site review criteria, yes or no? And do we think that option two is supported based on the uh, site review criteria, yes or no? And then that will tell us what our motion should be, I think. <laughs> um, because this is the question in front of us is, you know, we know that they are eligible for both of these things. And then our job is to say, okay, they're eligible. If we granted it, would it be compatible with the site review criteria? Would it meet the site review criteria? Mm -hmm. So I suggest we do that on each piece independently and then put the motion together. I think have to do that. Just to, just to be clear from, I, I, I so appreciate this. Just to be clear, we have a motion and a second and we have an amendment and a second. Consequently, no, we, yeah, 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 we do. So um, I would, I would suggest that uh, we take the amendment, the proposed amendment, in light of option one and option two, and and ultimately have a vote on the amendment, mm -hmm. up or down. Then on the motion, if it was amended or not, up or down. And then if we need to come back and make a different motion after that, but we have we have a motion and an amendment on the floor under consideration. Yes, and the motion and the amendment on the floor, and I appreciate this, this is good um, process here, is essentially to deny option one. So we would have to make a finding that they're not eligible for option one or not that they're not eligible, but that we don't think it meets the site criteria if we grant option one, because that's the denial that we would be making if we approve Kurt's motion that was seconded by ML. Right. All right, so essentially when we vote on the amendment, what we're actually voting on is whether we're gonna reopen the site review process to evaluate uh, if, that, if, if, if Kurt's proposal passes, we are essentially kind of reopening site review to then evaluate whether uh, that meets site review criteria. Are we not? We're considering both of them. Right, but if yours passes, oh. and then if yours passes, and then the amendment, the motion also passes, we, we've we got kind of a cluster there because we've said uh, we prioritize the four foot, but we're also approving the four foot or the seven foot. Like we, we, we are, I think we're creating a, a kind of a mess here. My, my amendment, my amendment amends the, the initial, language. The, right, the initial motion. So it but, strikes But we, but we haven't had um, a decision, like to, to- We haven't voted on the amendment. No, no, but to Hella's point, which was that your amendment creates sort of the same problem that Mark's initial mm -hmm. proposed motion language creates which is that we have not had a comment from the applicant as to, I'm gonna get the language wrong, but as to whether they are, they, they affirmatively accept the denial of one of the two options. Is that correct? Because his amendment, Kurt's amendment denies one of the options basically, negates one of the options. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I followed. Well, the, 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 exact the analysis you gave for Marks applies to Kurtz, I think. You still need the applicant's proactive acceptance of one option and acceptance of the denial of the second option because the- Yeah, the, the applicant's preferred and for sure request is for the option that it sounds like a Kurt may not find meets the criteria. Um, so there would have to be a nailed finding on that unless the applicant withdrew that request. So I'm not gonna call the question, but I'd suggest that we vote on the amendment. I think, I, do people feel informed enough to vote on the amendment? Uh, sure. Can you take down the thing so we can um, see George? Okay, um, can you please repeat your amendment? And, and do, wait, uh, Amanda, do you have it? 
Okay. Uh, I emailed you the amendment. I can read We have to it. vote on the amendment first. This, look right. this is the amendment. This is the amendment. Okay. Yeah. So the, oh, uh, that is what? what the language would look like if the amendment were approved, but the actual amendment- Was the actual amendment struck motion, was a strikeout. Right, motion, motion <laughs> to delete the words up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof or alternatively comma. Right, that's, that's, that's the amendment, that's yes. The amendment. So the amendment is to strike the seven foot option. Correct. Yes, the seven foot, six inch option. Amanda, do you have that? Okay, hold on. Um, Hella, I have a question. Can I ask a question about that amendment proposed? Do we have to include in the amendment um, eliminating all references to that seven foot six inch option from the from conditions the of findings. approval that would be great I mean that would yeah. cover basically what Mark's been wondering about it's just yeah. like okay we eliminate all the other references to the option that has been taken okay so can you direct that to Amanda please no it's trying we're just trying to get the language of the amendment of the proposed right. amendment include correct There, that. It, there's an additional language that has to be added, I'm sorry, which means we have to make a motion again because no. it's new language. And since it effectively would be a denial of the primary request, it would be good to incorporate that as well Okay. in, okay. in a direct way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think, Kurt, are you gonna work on all of that? Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, George. Do we want to? I, I just had a quick process question. Uh, given how long this is taking us, I, do we want to just do a do a quick straw poll on who would even be for this before we before we go far, you know like machinate this this amendment? That well, would be a good idea. Well, and in fact, you can't take an amendment that's been made and seconded and then start modifying it without amending it. So, I would, George. I'm I concur. We need to vote on Kurt's amendment as proposed and seconded. And then we can do something else if should it fail. But we can't continue to amend an amendment without making a motion to okay. amend. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. All right. So the motion is to delete the words up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof or alternatively, comma. Laura. Because this would amount to us basically saying we find that this al this um, alternative does not meet the site review criteria, I'm going to vote no. I'm not prepared to make that finding. Right. And I'm voting no because I'm learning that this was an ill-formed amendment. <laughs> <laughs> ML. Yeah. Well, if it's ill-formed, I'm I'm a, I'm a no. I guess we can make a better formed one, but for now, thanks. Mark? No. George? All right, well, the motion makers and the seconder said no, so uh, no. No, all right, so it fails. Okay, would you like to propose an amendment that is better formed? Well, I would, but I think now would be an appropriate time to accept George's suggestion and just to take a straw all before we go through all of this to see if there would be support for this at all. Okay. Uh, George, you want to repeat how you'd like us, what, what exactly it is you'd like us to take a straw poll? Well, I think, I think, um, I think what Kurt was suggesting was he was going to reform his amendment um, to, to address the issues that Hella has brought up, council has brought up, in which case he would be supportive for that. Is that correct, Kurt? Correct. Okay. Um, okay. so that's what I was suggesting. And I, you could also take a straw poll separately on both proposals on whether you think that the proposal meets the site review criteria. And All then right. when you know, 
that you can work on motions. All right, so let's take a straw poll on, I'm gonna frame it this way of limiting the uh, motion, the, what gets approved to the four feet of additional height. Cause that, I realize that's not exactly what the language will say, but that's the intent of your, am your amendment, correct? Sarah? Yeah. I feel like we need to either say, we think that the option with the seven foot roof, seven foot, six inch roof meets the site review criteria, yes or no. And we think that the four foot option meets the site review criteria, yes or no, right? Because that's essentially what we're doing. If we limit it to just one of those, we're saying that the other one does not meet the site review criteria. We have to make that finding that it does not meet the site review criteria. It can't just be, we have a preference for one for some other reason. It has to be because the one that they've asked for does not meet the site review criteria. All righty, let's take a straw poll on whether the four foot option meets the site review criteria, Laura. Yes. Mark. Mark or Kurt? I'm sorry, Kurt. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> ML. Yes. Mark. Mark. I, I, I'm. I'm. We, we're not voting. This is like a straw poll. There's no vote here. This is a straw poll, so we know what kind of uh, language Kurt should even bother trying to develop. Right. Just trying to move quickly. The, the question is another ill-formed question. So um, I, I'm, I, I will not participate in this, in this straw poll because the question is, if, if I say yes to this in the straw poll, then, then I'm lending support to removal of the seven foot option. No, no, no. We're looking at them independently. Right. Does it meet this We're one? But, so, but, but the applicant has submitted something and we've been told that we can't break the, the application up. I, my initial motion was to approve the seven foot option and remove okay, so, so Mark abstains. Can we, can we keep moving? Abstain. It's it's not a vote. It's just a straw poll. George. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So it's straw poll is yes. All right. And the second straw poll is on does the seven foot also meet the site review uh, criteria? And and I would say yes, based on, you know, that when I think about the site review criteria, what changes if we give them, we already have an approved site review, right? For these townhomes, what changes if we give them an additional seven foot, six inches of height? And for me, that additional seven foot, six inches of height does not tip it over into not meeting the site review criteria. I could not cite what in the site review criteria they don't meet. So for me, yes. Okay, and as I explained earlier, for me, no. So remember, it's not a vote. It's just a straw Abstaining. <laughs> Guys, you go. Okay. I am, I am. But we'll have to vote on it eventually. So go ahead. Abstaining. Mark, I mean, sorry, um, George. So um, I agree with Laura. Um, as, as much as I appreciate what Kurt and ML have suggested, and I, and I do truly appreciate the intention because it was my concern when I bring this back, when this was, when this was originally proposed, it was because of the annexation agreement that this was limited to two stories, but 35 feet. The applicant came back and said, we'll do, th we'll do three stories and 35 feet. People were for it. And, and that's what I meant by scope creep. However, um, that's no longer the case uh, as Hella pointed out. Uh, unfortunately, um, had we known about this flood criteria, we might've come up with a different um, solution. I know this is straw poll, so I'm, I'm getting to the point I'm trying to move quickly. Um, but I, I agree with Laura in this context. Um, thank you. Okay. Did you? Yeah, Sarah, do you have a position? I, I, I would abstain except <laughs> at this point, I kind of don't care. Um, uh, I don't think you have to vote for the for language that limits it to the shorter. Okay, I agree. Because even an amendment needs four votes to pass. That's right. Okay, so I withdraw my amendment. I guess I can't really withdraw. Oh, well, I haven't made it, so never mind. All right, we, we, we canceled, we yep. uh, voted down the other amendment. All right, so we now have a motion on the table without any amendments to it. Uh, I will reread the motion. If someone would please put it up on screen for me. Yeah. 
I put on my glasses. Put my screen up. That's the old one. That's the wrong one. Okay. Planning board motion to approve site review application LUR 2023-00050, including a height modification request to allow for up to seven feet, six inches of additional height with a pitched roof, or alternatively, up to four feet of additional height with or without a pitched roof for each townhome building within the approved Shining Mountain Waldorf School Development, adopting the staff memorandum as findings of fact, including the attached analysis of review criteria and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Laura. Yes. Kurt. No. ML. Mark. Yes. George. Yes. I'm a no. Yes. It passes uh, four to two. We are going to take a five minute break and then we will come back and do agenda item B. I'm sorry.
get started again. Uh, George, are you there somewhere? No, not yet. Okay, he'll come back. All right. Um, agenda item B, public hearing and recommendation to city council regarding proposed ordinance 8620, amending title nine, land use code BRC 1981 to clarify existing code sections, updating update graphics and improve the clarity of the code and setting forth related details. Lisa is our fabulous staff person. We have a 10 minute staff presentation. We assume maybe 10 minutes of board question and discussion and then vote. Take it away, Lisa. All right, good evening, planning board. Nice to see you again. I'm Lisa Hood, senior city planner. First, I want to clarify that this is a different ordinance than the one we were talking about two weeks ago. Um, so this is not the process streamlining. This is our code cleanup ordinance, but we are excited to bring this forward. It's a uh, kind of technical update that we do every few years. So the purpose tonight for you, this is, this is a formal um, public hearing. So uh, the purpose tonight is to make a recommendation to city council on this ordinance. This is our code cleanup. It's something we do periodically. We look through the land use code and all the different land use reviews we've done over the last few years and issues and hiccups that we found along the way. And we fix errors that we've run into in the code, simplify parts of the language that's um, been misinterpreted or confusing, and then codify some of our existing practices that aren't um, in the code. The last time we did one of these technical cleanup ordinances was back in 2020, so it's been almost four years. Uh, so we've accumulated a few more things to fix. Some of the proposed changes or the proposed changes in the ordinance are really limited to four topics. So corrections, fixing inaccuracies, like we have some incorrect cross references, typographical errors. Those are just things that are going to happen when we're editing the code many times over. Clarifications, again, things that just make the code language clearer. We have a couple of changes to graphics which um, we do have some graphics in our code. So just some address some common misunderstandings with those graphics, try to make those um, as uh, easy to communicate these important uh, parts of the code as we can. And then also consistency. So there's some changes that are intended to ensure consistency either with state requirements or other requirements or just the existing city practices that we've been doing. So I have just a few examples of each of those types to give you an idea of the four types of changes. We have some under our corrections, one of the ones that Carl and I thought was funniest that no one had ever noticed <laughs> was um, a typo or maybe a codifier error that's been in there for years, um, which has a standard for parking height and it's supposed to be building height. And so we noticed that looking through the code. So just fixing things like that. There's one in this lot line and boundary verification that was language that was struck from the code in 2000, but was still there. Um, not to point out just codifier uh, silliness, <laughs> but so um, just looking through the history of that. And then also the things just like cross references and things like that, that as we do many ordinances, there's always gonna be a few errors that need to be cleaned up. We also have clarification. So one example of this is our standards for open space and balconies. This is one that really just the language about individual balconies trips up staff and applicants a lot. So we tried to clean up that language so the intent is clearer. I mentioned the graphics. We've amended the graphics that explain the measurement of height. So that's a really important um, part of our code and also our side yard wall articulation standards. These are graphics that exist right now, but we've just improved them based on kind of their utility with applicants. And then our consistency is the final one. So some examples of these types of changes in 9217, uh, in one part of the code, we talk about how annexations require a recommendation from planning board, but we don't actually explain what that, that um, public hearing looks like the way that we explain rezoning. So just adding some language there, and then the, the bottom example is some consistency with state requirements related to mineral estate notices. So there's changes like that, just keeping things consistent. So those are examples of changes. This is a much simpler ordinance than I usually bring to you all. So the suggested motion is to um, adopt ordinance 8620 and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, do we have any questions for Lisa? Um, I have a question for you, sir. Are we going to go to this 
are we going to go through this line by line or area by area or are we going to how how do you propose that we give you input uh, i'd suggest you just ask the give the input that you wish to give that's my suggestion okay oops i don't have my mic on <laughs> um i guess i'll do it in little bits and pieces to give other people a chance as well but um just for procedural purposes it's you're just asking questions now because there no, still has to be a public be hearing. Public yeah. We still have to do public comment. Right. So if you're just asking questions at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, and could we maybe bring up the red lined code so that we can look at? Yep. One second. So just take me a second. So um, the first question I have, it seems like um, I'm looking at 6.14.2. Okay. And it are 6.14.2 and 6.16.2 the same thing? What's the duplication? So Title VI is our licensing part of the code, so that's not actually our land use code, and it's specific to medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. A lot of the language is almost identical, so that's why you see it twice, okay. because it's in both medical and recreational. Okay, so my question is in 614.8H. 614.8H. 6-14-8-H. And it may or may not be here under changes, um, but it states that ventilation is required. So you might want need to look at the, <laughs> the, the full code. It says that ventilation is required. And so my question is, um, because I've been to a number of establishments that are adjacent to or down the street from um, marijuana, uh, facilities. And one was a t-shirt printing, a printing place. And they lost a lot of inventory because of the smell. So I'm curious, what do we have in place for the um, enforcing the ventilation requirement in, in the, and, and I'm guessing it's 614.8H is, is where is where it lands. So I'm, I'm just curious because it seems like it's a problem. Sure, so um, that's kind of out of the scope of this ordinance since we're just trying to clean up and clarify language. And I'm not prepared to answer the question about ventilation just because that's a licensing requirement. The intent in this ordinance is really just to um, correct an error. There's, a, there's some overlap between references between the licensing code and, and the land use code regarding mixed use development. And so we've run into some issues of that interpretation. So that's what we're trying to address with this, not necessarily opening up the whole marijuana licensing regulations, which would be a much more um, significant change that we'd have to do more study and input for. So any reference to 614-8H required ventilation, there is not a reference to some other place that will say, and I'm for clarification for people to know, okay, ventilation is required, and here is how it's required. That, it, it isn't related to the land use code standard. So the only thing related to the land use code is the location that the, the businesses can be located in. And so that's where the mixed use development and residential zone district changes that you see um, tie into the land use code. Oh, so 614-8H is not even in the scope of what you're- Right, exactly. Oh, because to me, okay, what's the problem? The problem is that- <laughs> the ventilation. Yeah, it might be a larger issue for a okay. project. Okay. And I see why they're the same. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's confusing. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. All right. Uh, Mark, do you have anything? No. George, do you have anything? Nope. Uh, Kurt has something. Yeah. 
And I sent you a list of questions and thank you very much for the clarifications there. I just have a couple of follow-ups on those. And one relates to this very first code, which says mixed use development means, yeah, that, that paragraph. Mixed use development means a building or a project or a development, which may consist of one or multiple lots or parcels. So my question still is about the definition of a project or a development if it's on multiple lots. So imagine, you know, you've got two lots next to each other and the same developer owns them and they're developed though in sequence. Are they the same project? It, I'm just not clear that we have firm definitions about what is a project or a development. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I saw Hella unmuting herself, so I <laughs> pointed to Hella. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there is some ambiguity in there. Um, the reason we're bringing forward this particular change is because it had become an issue. So we were trying to clarify that, but I think to make bigger changes um, would have to involve a bigger process mm -hmm. because this language also that we're clarifying came out of um, issues that had been experienced. So we're just trying to make it a little bit better, okay. consistent with how the code was interpreted when, when the last interpretation issue came up. Yeah. But we realize it's not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> what? Next time it'll be perfect. Okay, well maybe we can just add that to the next list someplace. Okay. Yeah, and, and and it's part of the marijuana licensing group that administers that. So we're, we just picked up on it um, because it, it implicates the, a, a little bit the land use review, but it will be a bigger project. Yeah, okay. Um, the next question was about, uh, and I think Mark, was sort of asking about this too, about the parking surfacing. And so my understanding is the current code requires, as it, as it currently stands, it requires paved parking. So some sort of solid paved parking, right? So it reads currently, right? All parking areas are paved with asphalt concrete or other similar permanent hard surface. Right, okay. and, then, and then there's an exception for the detached dwelling units. So really the only change here, flipping around the order of the wording of that sentence, because it's a little confusing. Right. And then also just making sure that there's some, um, the parking areas for those detached dwelling units have to be something that's maintained well, things like that. So it's some, some kind of material that's able to sustain the weight of a vehicle. So it gives a little discretion for that what materials used for detached dwelling units. And that's consistent with our current interpretation. Okay, so even though it, there's no requirement currently for materials capable of sustaining the weight, we require that somehow, anyhow, even though it's not in the code? It's been the interpretation, right, of staff. So that's why we want mm -hmm. the code to match what the interpret, yeah, to clarify so that people are aware that that's the, the policy that we're implementing. Okay, well, that, that's fine. I mean, I'm a little worried about us applying rules that aren't in the code, but um, sounds good. Okay, and Can then- I ask uh, a question about that same yeah. little clarify. So in looking at this, and I think that Mark brought this up, um, are we precluding any changes to come from, uh, the uh, other codes that would start to encourage pervious materials. Um, could the entire requirement be for surfaces with materials capable of sustaining the weight and impacts of the associated vehicle usage? I mean, wouldn't that suffice for all of the definition or all of the um, requirement rather than still having paved asphalt concrete 
or other similar permanent hard surface remain? Don't we have more leeway for the future? Yeah, I think that there could be a future um, more significant change considered. I think getting back to this being a limited scope of cleanup ordinance and trying to just align with existing practice, I think there could be a larger conversation about permeability and things like that in the future, but that's not really the scope of this project since it's just cleanup. Um, so we're just trying to align with our current practice and looks like Charles maybe had something. Well, we're going to be working on parking code changes later this year. So, <laughs> it, you know, might be an opportunity to get at some of those. And so um, just a, a bigger question, we're looking at the parking code changes, would we then need to go back here and change things in all of this rather than just making it ready? <laughs> yeah, possibly. But, you know, if we're opening up, um, you know, the entire parking code changes, it, it's not uncommon um, if we're doing a code change that we have to change references throughout the code that, you know, would have impact. So that, that wouldn't be uncommon. Okay. Right, Sorry. I, Mark, um, Kurt, when you're done. I'm done. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. Um, yeah, so just on the same topic, and, and I appreciate your prompt answer to my uh, question today. I, I still struggle with the, the, and I agree it's a clarification, but it's a clarification in the wrong direction in a way. All parking areas shall be, shall be is a, is a, um, is a better way of stating a requirement than are, <laughs> but it's like, Okay, we're now we're really going the wrong. Or you shall do the wrong thing. So I just, I just that's that's where my struggle with this comes. I'll wait. I'll, I'll anxiously await the uh, the revised parking uh, ordinance. And I appreciate that, um, Mark. That doesn't mean that we can't still do you know pervious asphalt, you know those sorts of things on private property. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily preclude um, pavement typologies that allow for stormwater. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kurt, you have more? Yeah, just two other quickly. One was that it seemed like an extraneous use of the word minimum in 33. Did you already remove that? Awesome. And then the last one, and this was just reading it, I was kind of struck that this seemed outdated, referring to act of God. I, I don't know whether that's a problem or Should not, the act but of she <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it just felt a little bit 1960s or something. So, yeah, we discussed that as a staff. I think Act of God is still an insurance claim yeah. policy. So that's where that came from. Certainly up to the planning board, whether you think that's appropriate to keep that in the code. So I'd leave that in your court. I, okay. I don't know that we have a recommendation either way. It can stay in or it could go. Okay. From a legal standpoint. Yeah, I think the attorneys no. were comfortable with it wasn't in there okay okay then my preference would be to strike that could we put it in quotation marks could, could we could we put it in quotation marks as a term of art act of god because that's what it is it's a citation back to insurance policy and then that kind of the scare quotes make me more comfortable i'm not going to fall on my sword about this but just a suggestion okay. uh, ml so I have one other um, question, and this is under uh, 975. Drawings? Yeah. <laughs> so um, two, two points. The first, I'll start with the uh, under number two, the third bullet. It's really hard to Yeah, read. I'm sorry, that's really hard. I know, I had a hard time to. So, it adds something that isn't currently, this is not a clarification or a, it's adding something that currently isn't in the, um, in the code as far as a means to determine the edge to which one anchors the 25 feet um, criteria. That doesn't exist in, in the current. And so that seems like it's outside of the scope. Well, there are a few changes that are codifying existing interpretation. So kind of similar to the parking one, that's how we've been interpreting the code. And that's how we've been in, um, implementing the code is that the 25 foot, the, the like an additional deck or porch 
is part of the building side. And so we measure from that extended porch and then we actually measure from the post of the deck. So that's what the drawing tries to show. Um, so it's, it's, it's clarifying, it's codifying a, an interpretation to give more clarity in that, in that drawing. So the current uh, staff or the interpretation had been beyond what the current um, diagrams show. Is that what you're saying? They've been working beyond this. I'm looking at, well, I don't know what page it is of the current code, but I'm looking at the current diagrams and it, it doesn't have any overhang. It doesn't have any decks. It doesn't have that at all. So people could come in and suddenly there's a, there's, wouldn't that require a bigger conversation as to whether we want decks to be counted as the edge or not? Well, I think it, I'm, they, we regularly make interpretations of what the code means. And so this diagram is intended to reflect the interpretation that staff has made of what, um, how that lowest point is changed by adding a deck or a porch or things like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's a longstanding interpretation, uh, probably goes back decades. Um, so I think from a staff perspective, it's probably not that radical since that's how it's been um, you know, interpreted um, for quite some time. But from the, the public, it could it could feel kind of radical in that. Well, I think one of the other points, the edge of a building, that's not going to move, right? A deck that can change over time. That is not a a, a substantive construct um, to use as these are very impactful. The twenty five foot to the lowest point are hugely impactful to a project. And I, I have personally, professionally, never encountered the deck being counted. Thank goodness, <laughs> I think I would have had hair standing up. Um, it, it seems really illogical. And I, I, I would put it out to a bigger conversation about, um, are we looking to establish this 25 foot uh, reference point to something that is permanent and non-movable because it's got big implications to the building or is something that can in fact be changed quite easily, a deck, a balcony. Those are not permanent components of the structure. So it, that seems like it's a bigger change. In your minds, it might be just clarifying, but out here in the public, it feels bigger. <laughs> Hi, uh, good evening. Planning Board, Brad Mueller, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, we recognize with all of these items, there can be a you know, substantive issue behind them. And uh, we regularly are happy to compile things that are of concern or, or observed by the board. Um, I, I just urge you to understand that we are called on a daily, if not hourly basis to interpret the code. And, and we try to make sure we're doing that consistently. So that's what this represents is as Charles said, several decades of interpretation, and we're just trying to make it in a language that's clear so we're not having to re-explain it to folks who are confused about it. If you'd like us to add this as a substantive matter to bring up at some future point on a list of other things, we can certainly do that. Um, but I would urge you to you know, recognize that this is, this is simply in the interest of clarity. Um, well, I, I guess I, oh, I was gonna before you move, don't move on from this. I'm not okay. On. okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I, what, I, what I'm gonna say is that the current drawing, the current diagrams that are in the current code are pretty clear. There's nothing confusing about it. I think it would be confusing if I use this and then went into planning staff and planning staff says, yeah, but a balcony is going to, and I'm like, no, that this drawing, this, this doesn't imply that. And so we design our project or- yeah. Kind of like what we saw tonight, right? You design your project and then you realize you hit an edge. Right. I, so that's the these question. These three can correct me, but I think, you know, we would always advise that the drawings are ancillary and not the legal entity. And rather it's the language that is, and it's the language that we've interpreted and the drawings are meant to reflect that. And this revised drawing better reflects the language. So we would have to go back and, you know, address the substantive issue of the language, which we're not prepared to do in the scope of this, this conversation. So in, in this current, the way it currently reads, determine the building side, including decks and porches. That's what you're trying to illustrate is the including decks and yeah. porches. Yeah. Nobody reads the fine print. 
um, I see what you're saying. I, I think it might warrant some con structure, future yeah. consideration. Mark, did you want to, I have one more thing. Uh, no, I just, on, on this topic, my question is, and, and ML, I appreciate your very careful reading of this. The current code and illustration, including de right. including Dex and Porches. Right, but Brad just said the drawings are I ancillary. Okay. Well, I, it sounds like that's what they're trying to do is avoid people looking at the current drawing and being confused right. and then hearing something different from staff and being like, but that doesn't match the drawing. So they're like, okay, let's fix the drawing so that people are not caught flat footed when they design their, their projects. Right, it feels substantive, but I see your point. Brad, read the fine print. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. And maybe put it on the, to check, because it seems to me like a deck can, is not a permanent, necessarily as permanent as a building, so. Yeah, absolutely, we can add that. Um, Carl, did you, you seem eager to, do you have something to add? <laughs> we wanna hear from Carl. Shoot me now. Carl Geiler, Planning and Development Services. I was just going to add that, you know, in all the years that, you know, Charles and I have worked here, we've worked on permits. This has been the interpretation the entire time we've been here. Uh, we did coordinate with our permitting staff, and it was because of the daily questions that come up on the height modifications based on the older graphic that led to these updated graphics to make those clarifications. So it isn't really new territory. This is clarifying the existing condition, we can certainly change it in the future. But I'll also mention that we have brought some height modifications before the board um, that required a height modification by virtue of the fact that they added a deck and it didn't make the building taller, it just changed the low point and all of a sudden they're in a height modification. So it has been something that we've done for a, a long time, but it, we can certainly look into changing that in the future. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Any other points? Um, you can, you no, I, I don't have any. Thank oh. you. So the last thing I would I would wonder about is under definitions, nine sixteen one, and I guess as a point of clarification, referring to nine seven nine D, which which is about the. Um, 979D is the bulk plane. Mm -hmm. And the bulk plane has a reference to roof overhangs or eaves of the primary roof. And there is no definition of a roof overhang. Okay. So I think uh, under, it needs to be clarified because I have encountered that. And it's, it's just like, let's just know if we're talking about industry definition of an overhang, or I found it to be at odds with the staff definition of an overhang. Okay. Um, so let's just be clear about what is meant by that language. And that would be under 916.1, which is the definitions. Definitions. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the hard work line by line. And those are all my comments, right? <laughs> Not that many. All right. Any Thank other, you so much. Any other comments? All right. So we now have a public hearing opportunity. Is there anyone online who wants to speak? Yes, we do have one person online. <clears throat> Lynn Siegel. It wasn't at all clear to me on the post image um, where that that it's not just the deck, it's a post on the deck. If you extended that post out to the end of the deck, it would change very much what the 25 foot setback was. So anyone that's looking at that to use to um, determine what they're going to build there, that it's not clear to me, but I'm not a builder, I'm an ultrasound tech, but um, I do look at three-dimensional items in the human body and that just doesn't make sense to me. But um, let's see, the um, 
the perviousness. Um, I think that's a good thing. And um, the act of God, I don't think religion should come into urban planning. Um, and I don't care if the insurance industry uses it. It's inappropriate. Um, it there's there've got to be you know words that etymologically explain what they're trying to say, and someone just has to determine that. Um, but as to what happened tonight with the approval of this thing at Shining Mountain, something has to be done much more than just. Uh, sorry, Lynn, we're not talking about Shining Mountain at this point. Much if you want. more than I'm sorry, we're Lynn, Lynn please, to be... please keep your comments to this particular public hearing item. Then I'm just going to sit out my three minutes and I don't want anyone blocking the thing for me because this is really important. And I think someone, everyone here should think about what happened earlier tonight? It's really, really inappropriate that they got an extra Thank you, Lynn. level. Thank you, Lynn. Um, all right. Um, all right. We will now go to discussion. Is there a discussion? Or could we go right to the motion making? Go ahead. So I just want to thank staff for all of the work that you put into this. I'm sure it is scintillating reading, going through the code line by line, looking for errors. So thank you so much for your hard work on this. And I guess my question is, when we go to a vote, um, did anything that happened here tonight change the proposal in front of us? Or are we voting on the proposal that was in front of us before our discussion? Yes. Yes, what? <laughs> yes, it sounds to me like you're voting. Yeah, no, you're. It sounds like you're voting on uh, what was originally proposed by staff this evening without any amendments. Okay, so if we wanted anything that we said tonight to change that proposal, it would have to be an amendment proposed by the board. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Charles. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll say I do not feel strongly enough about my little quotation marks to make an amendment, but thank you for considering. I know you want to say something, something you want to say, I can see. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I would move to strike the words act of God from, and I'm sorry, I don't have the proper reference. Um, if you can pull that up. 9102B. 9102B. Go ahead, Mark. Are you, um, suggesting a replacement or does it make sense to remove those words? Does it still read? It doesn't make sense without those words. I, I think that staff four is fine with it with, without those words. Right. Yeah. We have, yes. there's other calamity. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm. Oh, so you were saying that the attorneys are comfortable striking that language. Oh, okay. I totally misunderstood that. Thank you for clarifying staff and Kurt. Go ahead, ML. So we're offering, do we offer this as an amendment? We haven't made a motion yet. Oh. So it's just discussion oh. at this moment. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I thought we were. Okay. I'd like to um, make sure that we have a definition of a roof overhang. Okay. So, uh, George, did you have any comments? George? Uh, nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mark, did you have any more comments? No. Okay, so it seems like we should make a motion and then people can start making amendments. Uh, can you please pull up the motion that was proposed for us? Okay. ML would like to make the motion. I do. Uh, Planning board recommends that city council adopt ordinance 8620, amending title nine land use code to clarify existing code sections, update graphics, and improve the clarity of the code and setting forth related details. Now we need a second. Did someone second. like you got a second? All right. Now is like someone want to make an amendment? Yeah, I would move that the words or act of God 
be removed from section 9 10 2 B. Second. Wait, wait, wait. I, I second. Okay. So you don't care about what we replace it with? It, it sounds like we did not need to make a replacement because it already includes the words other calamity yeah. is already in the language. Okay. Um, we could, could someone please send that language to Amanda? This is a motion to recommend. Okay. While he's typing that out, does anyone have other amendments? Are there other people who want to make amendments? All right, so that was the only one. Do we need oh, to? I'm sorry. Sorry. Do we need to vote on them one by one before we make another. Yeah, one? I'm just while he's oh. typing, I wanted to find out if someone else had an amendment. Okay, cool. <laughs> Should I make it? Uh, do you have it written out? Um, and I recommend you you just write it out for yourself so that then you can. Um, this draft. I propose that we amend section 916.1 under general definitions, include a definition for roof overhang. I'll second that. Okay. Um, we have to make sure that Amanda has caught that. That's why I was hoping you would write that down. Not just say it out loud, but to write it down so that when you repeat it back to her, it's what you said originally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look at Okay, great. So let's see where Amanda is with. Amanda, how are you on uh, the First Amendment? And sorry, I did not. I did not specify where that went, but it could go at the very end, I think, and comma and striking the words or act of God from 9102 B. Okay. Okay, so then the second amendment, which was made by ML and seconded by Kurt. Mark. I'm sorry, Mark is, and now can you please read this? To amend the motion to include an addition to 9-16-1 general definitions to include a definition of roof overhang. Yes. Yes, 9 16 1 general definition. To, in, to include a definition of roof overhang. All right, so that's been made and seconded. Any I'm sorry, is that, I'm sorry, the fourth word there, is it include in, include in addition or include an addition, ML? A what? definition. No, in the first, the top there, motion to include in addition or an, an addition, an. an addition. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other amendments that need to be made and seconded? All right, we're gonna work backwards. We're gonna vote on these. Um, Emma, I will repeat the uh, motion to include an addition to 9-16-1 general definitions to include a definition of roof overhang. Laura? Yes. Kurt. Yes. 
Sarah is a yes. ML? Yes. Mark? Yes. George? Yes. Second, motion to strike the words or act of God from BRC 9 2 I'm sorry, 9 10 2B. Laura? Yes. Yes. <laughs> ML? Yes. Mark? No. George? No. And I'm also a no, so that fails. Okay, and fi the final uh, main motion, uh, planning board recommends that city council adopt ordinance 8620 amending title nine land use code to clarify existing code sections, update graphics and improve the clarity of the code and setting forth related details. Laura? Yes. Kurt? Yes. ML? Yes. Mark? Yes. George? Yes. There is a yes. All right, so it passes with the uh, root, the definition addition. And thank you very much. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> What's left of your evening, enjoy it. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to agenda title, agenda item number or letter C, uh, public hearing and consideration of a standard wetland permit application for the proposed renovation of the Chapman Drive trailhead and construction of a pedestrian bridge over Boulder Creek, generally located at 38474 Boulder Canyon Drive in Boulder County, WET 2023-00020. We're assuming 45 minutes total with a 10 minute staff presentation, 15 minute applicant presentation, public comment, and then discussion. And um, uh, this is a call, this is a public hearing based on a call up. So I don't know who's, oh. It's All right, Mr. Stafford, you are on. All right, give me just another moment here. Yeah, I'm not sure your mic's on, by the way. Try that again. Give me <laughs> just a moment, get the presentation running. I need permission to share screen, please. All right, thank you. Good evening, uh, Edward Stafford, Senior Civil Engineering Manager in Planning Development Services. And I'll give a brief, very brief presentation about this particular wetland well, permit for the Chapman Drive Bridge and Trailhead. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the permit process itself, a summary of the proposed project, the key issue that's been identified for discussion tonight, and a staff recommendation. The review process is a reminder uh, the, this permit was originally evaluated as part of the project for consistency with the stream wetland and water body protection criteria and was uh, issued by the city manager on January 2nd for the code that issuance is sub or was subject to call up and this board did call that uh, action up on January 16th. So it's now in front of you tonight to make a decision on whether or not this permit meets the criteria in section 939E 3 and 4. Location of the project, um, you can see the red arrow there is the location, and you'll see that it's actually located several miles outside of the city of Boulder. So one of the uh, unique aspects of this particular section of the code is that it is actually written to apply the land that is not within the city of Boulder's jurisdiction, but is owned by the city of Boulder or projects being done by the city of Boulder. I point that out as a clarity because other issues underlying it in terms of land use, whether or not this is a, an allowed use, the uh, standards of that are actually the Boulder County jurisdiction, given that this is not actually within the city of Boulder. So the only item you have in front of you tonight and the only regulatory approval this project requires is this stream wetland and water body protection permit. A blow up to the site so you can see a little bit closer to where it is off of Boulder Canyon Drive. The project itself as has been proposed is to reconfigure the existing trailhead to construct a new pedestrian bridge to connect to the Boulder Canyon Trail. Um, there is an existing trailhead there. 
There were things that were damaged in 2013 and have had interim improvements. And so the applicant, which is the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department of the city, is now coming forward to make final improvements. The applicant is present tonight and they will be making a presentation to give additional project details um, post this portion here. Um, I did leave the table in here of the wetland impacts as a reminder. And these are really the wetland stream and water body impacts. The code lays it out in three different areas, the first being the wetland itself. And you'll notice in here, this project does not have any permanent impacts and has temporary impacts only to the wetland. Then there are two types of buffers, the inner buffer, which is the first 25 feet, and the outer buffer, the second 25 feet for a total of 50 feet of buffer. And you can see both the permanent and the temporary impacts. Mm -hmm. It's important to note the differences there. Temporary impacts um, have to be restored and can be restored. Permanent impacts have to be looked at in terms of whether they require mitigation or not. The proposed project is on the screen here. You can see the trailhead with parking and adequate circulatory route and the pedestrian bridge. I've highlighted on here, although it is not easy to see on the screen, the three different lines. That blue line on the left side is the outer edge of the designated wetland boundary. And you'll notice that the only thing that is uh, impacting that that will be temporary will be the construction of the pedestrian bridge. The second line, the green line, is the inner buffer of the wetland, area, wetland protection area. And you can also see within that, um, the improvements are primarily limited to that connection to the pedestrian bridge. The gold or yellow, depending on how you look at that color last line, is that outer buffer area, which you can see does encompass a portion of the trailhead parking area primarily and some of the landscape associated with it. The key issue before you tonight is the consideration of whether or not this application has met the criteria in 939E3 and E4 of the Boulder Revised Code. There are two sections of code there. There is one that's applicable to any and all permits under this, both standard and conditional. That information is in your staff memo packet. I was not gonna cover those by item tonight. We will cover the second section, which is what's applicable to what is called the standard permit, which is what's actually um, eligible for the call-up procedures that you've activated by calling this permit up. There are four key issues within that, in that 939E4 of consideration. The first one is a requirement for minimization to the impacts to the maximum extent feasible, as it says in the code. So that is looking at the project to determine, has it considered design to minimize the impacts? For example, should it have this project come in and put most of it within the buffers or even the wetland area and left the area outside of the protection area, as the current ground that it is, that would have given us a pause to say, this does not appear to be the minimum to implement the project. In this particular case, they've actually pushed it as far as they can against Chapman Drive, given the grade and the location of Chapman Drive and the actual land that is opened as compared or owned by open space in comparison. And so we looked at that as a part of understanding the minimization um, aspect of it. Understand this can be a difficult part of the code when we've talked about minimization to the maximum extent possible, look at that to say it is not necessarily in there to be used as a way to say nothing is allowed. The code does provide for things that you can do within the inner buffer, the outer buffer, and the protected area and things that are prohibited. And so this is looking um, at those items as have been described in there to say, and has that been done in a way that minimizes those uh, permanent impacts. The second one is the minimal impact to the stream, the wetland, or the water body function. Um, and that is more particular to the wetland itself, in this case, or Boulder, uh, Boulder Creek. Um, and looking, is the project designed in a way not to impact things such as the hydrology, the ultimate habitat in there? Um, and because the project is only that portions of the pet bridge, which are minimal impacting, and there are no permanent impacts, staff's analysis was that they did meet this criteria. The third is a requirement for the protection of species and is a recognition of certain uh, habitats that are uh, critical to this type of area. And in this particular case, the applicant did submit information about the consideration of that, including their uh, discussions with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I did not identify any impacts to threatened and endangered species or the protected habitat areas. The fourth of it is the requirement to look at 
uh, and ensure that any mitigation that is required by the code has been looked at and has been proposed with a mitigation plan, which they have included in here to do some mitigation to additional buffer areas to make up for their permanent impacts to the buffer impact or to the buffer areas that they're impacting. Many more times can I say the word impact? <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things we look at. Again, I did not cover the uh, 939E3. Of course, if there are questions, we can certainly go through that. And that was in your packet. So ultimately, staff review and has a recommendation. that We have found that the proposal does meet the applicable criteria. Um, and we recommend that the planning board approve the application um, with the motion that you see in front of you. That includes the uh, adoption of the findings of fact from this memo and the conditions of approval that are included which are conditions that we routinely do include in both standard and conditional wetland permits. That concludes my presentation. As I indicated, the applicant is also here and we'll be able to add more about the project and its selection. Questions? Thank you. Who has questions? None? All right. Um, if our app, oh, you do. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Excuse me. I, yeah, it's, uh... You didn't raise your hand, so I thought I was... <clears throat> So, um, as the applicant, the uh, the permit that's being requested uh, meet has to the meet. Applicant the applicant hasn't made her proposed her presentation oh, oh, okay. yet, well, so it's questions for questions for Mr. Stafford. I'll hold my question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. I have one. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't mean to speak for you, Kurt, but it seems like part of the issue was how did staff determine that a turnaround for trailers was needed here, like horse trailers and hand cycle trailers? How did you determine that that, that needed to be part of the project design? So when we look at these in review, we don't look to determine whether or not what they want to propose is an appropriate thing to build there. We look at whether or not in first the chart it's allowed. In this case, it would be considered impervious or additional paved and impervious area to say, is that permittable to begin with here? And then they'll look to see if that design is appropriate. So we don't look to say, is it right to put a trailhead here, for example, or have they included the right elements? Um, that's really independent of this process. Thank you. And I just also want to say thank you for the excellent short presentation. I feel like I know so much more about these kinds of permits. Thank you, Edward. Thank you. Go ahead. Just to follow up on that, though, in 939E4, <laughs> I think I got that right, uh, the minimization criterion, it does talk about scope of the project. And so do you consider that? in your analysis? So we will look to see what kind of alternative analysis that was done, which was included in the report here as it relates to the scope. We will not necessarily use that to look to say, should it include uh, a turnaround? We may look at it more of, have you thought about different sizes of scope to limit the impact? Now, in this particular case, given that there were fairly limited permanent impacts to either the buffer and that they're primarily in the outer buffer that already starts to speak to what we would consider minimization. Thank you. George, you have any questions? Okay. Nope. All right. Now it's applicant's opportunity. Can you hear me here? Great. Hello, I'm Eileen Flack, Senior Landscape Architect with Open Space and Mountain Parks. I'm joined by Adam Gaylord, our Recreation Ecologist, and Jeff Haley, our Deputy Director of Trails and Facilities Online. Um. <laughs> um, as Edward mentioned, most of our property, most of the land we manage is outside of the city. And so we don't have an opportunity to share what we've been up to with you very often. And so I'm pleased to be able to answer the questions that were passed on to me and share what we're working on at Chapman Drive Trailhead. The existing trailhead is a temporary interim condition. It's substandard. It was created when we bought the property from the Schnell family in 2012. Um, it was used during the period when CDOT was working on all of the improvements on Boulder Canyon following the flood, and then also during the period when the county was um, 
developing the Boulder Canyon Trail. Now that we are ready to complete this final piece of the trail with the pedestrian bridge that is part of our project as a joint effort with the county, um, we are ready to finalize our design at the Chapman Drive Trailhead. OSMP manages 37 trailheads and 76 official access points. These provide access to over 6 million annual visitors. The trailheads are the first thing that they experience when they come to the system. And as we renovate our trailheads to deal with this and manage our increased use, we are implementing standards for their design um, to standardize our facilities and our amenities. There are a multitude of factors that contribute to trailhead design, as shown here. Um, we're really looking at these as a, an ecotone, a way to transition, a place where you transition from the built environment to the open space system. And so we're working hard to model stewardship and intuitive wayfinding, welcoming, inviting spaces, but to create access and safety and functionality at these trailheads. The Chapman Drive Trailhead was designed to support efficient use of space for um, and in compliance with all applicable federal, state, and local roadway engineering design requirements, public infrastructure and public safety requirements, accessibility standards, and then just generally appropriate gut requirements for well-functioning parking areas to set people up for a smooth transition to our open space system. This design supports first responder and emergency vehicle access and operations, maintenance vehicle and operations, passenger vehicle access and parking, accessible parking and oversized vehicle access and parking. So to answer is the main benefit a turnaround for equestrian and hand cycle use? No, but it does support those uses. Um, and just because I have these images up, there's a question about how hand cycles are transported. Um, some people use hitches. Um, open space our, ourselves, we use a trailer because we bring multiple um, uh, hand cycles at a time, but we don't dictate how people transport their equipment. Next, please. So there's a question about um, if we have data on equestrian and hand cycle usage. We don't because we can't, we don't currently provide for those facilities. So um, we don't have any data on usage, but we do have um, a lot of information about demand. Our charter specifically notes um, land for horseback riding is one of our charter purposes, um, preservation of regional agriculture and its, and its associated um, culture is identified in the comp plan. Our 2005 visitor master plan, which um, included extensive input from the equestrian community, calls for horse trailer parking at trailheads to direct visitor use to appropriate areas and away from sensitive areas. And then our 2011 um, West, Tra West Trail Study Area, which is on the right there, um, also with extensive input from the equestrian community. We, we identified over 70% of our trails in this area that allowed for horseback riding, but the only place to access the system with a trailer was actually outside of the West Trail Study Area at Dowdy Draw at the South End. Um, when we presented that to city council, they directed us to make our best effort to pursue horse trailer parking west of Realization Point, which is the circle in the middle. Mm -hmm. And now that we have the Jatman Drive trailhead, we're able to provide for horse trailer parking at that location. Um, the West TSA also specifically calls for trailhead improvements to increase access for people with disabilities wherever feasible. And then finally, our 2019 master plan um, identified horse trailer parking at trailheads as a way to honor a diverse range of passive recreation opportunities that respect the unique character and history of the Boulder community. There's a question about whether alternatives were analyzed. OSM goes through a rigorous design process where we include, we have a departmental core team that includes wetland, wildlife, recreation ecologists, and we all went back and forth and mulled over a lot of information um, to get to this thoughtful and sensitive design for this site. Um, our proposed design rep represents the minimum area required to safely support all of the required access and programming at this site. 
um, if, to a question about if there's additional disturbance from the turnaround, this, uh, the parking area was engineered for a 40 foot turn radius, which is for a trailer or emergency vehicles. And typically a passenger car re only requires a 26 foot radius. So it's a larger radius there. A question about shared parking. OSMP does not direct the public to encroach on or park on private property. And during venue events, as you can see here, this area is completely parked up and fully constrained. Um, we do have an access in easement in place that allows trailhead bound vehicles to cross the uh, vehicle bridge and access our trailhead. Part of the agreement language says that we need to include signage that directs um, visitors away from the adjacent properties and to our trailhead. Yeah. Um, the existing trailhead was really just graded into an existing site and it directs runoff to the Boulder Creek. We have nuisance flows and sediment going directly there. And um, the current condition also allows Visitors are curious and they start heading down and then those um, undesig undesignated trails create sediment and erosion issues. So we will be addressing all of that with our design. Um, our civil engineer developed a drainage memo um, creating kind of uh, watersheds or contributing areas and identified where all the runoff from the parking lot is going. Most of it is going to a bioretention water quality area in the center of the parking lot, um, some on the side of the parking lot but it's all accounted for in locations where sediment and pollutants can drop out and settle in there. And we have fencing along the, um, the west edge to keep visitors out of the um, creek corridor. So finally, the trailhead is sitting on a previously disturbed um, home site. It's nestled, tucked in between the Boulder Creek and the steep Chapman Drive. We've utilized the space as efficiently as possible. We are protecting resources and providing a safe and appropriate visitor experience. I hope I've answered your questions. I'm happy to answer any more. Thank you. Thank you. I know Mark is chomping at the bit. <laughs> so go ahead. No, no, go ahead. This is, I, I'm, I'm ready to go anytime. Go, go ahead, okay. and then we'll go to Kurt. Okay. Um, is, is it Eileen? Yeah. yeah okay, Eileen. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'm super familiar with this because I access it daily and almost daily, certainly weekly um, uh, for skiing, for cycling, for hiking all the time. It's a great job. I also was a uh, member of the 2011 West Trail Study Area Community Collaborative Group. Yes. And uh, that was a long process. I, the report says 6,500 hours contributed, yeah. Yeah, stuck it out. Um, what is the number of, this is a related question and don't, I'm not just off on a tangent. The number of parking spaces at the Red Rock Sanitas Trailhead. Do you happen to know that offhand? I don't, sorry. All right. The, uh, I, I counted 15 at the proposed in your, in your drawing. Mm -hmm. Is it 15? I think that's right. Okay. Um, uh, and I understand you operate within many uh, inter-jurisdictional requirements. Is there a required number of parking spaces based on usage, based on any, based on any criteria that I don't know about? No, there, are, there isn't because the, the system is so broad. Um, we don't have any, uh, any definite numbers that we're trying to hit. We're doing the best we can to accommodate the visitors that we have. Okay. Um, what is the requirement for the pedestrian bridge? And under what jurisdiction, what agency, where, where is the requirement for that pedestrian bridge uh, stated or outlined? So that's part of Boulder County's Boulder Canyon Trail, and it's the final piece to connect uh, to the Chapman Drive system. It's part of their original design and was They've been moving forward with those plans for years. So I don't know that there is a requirement for that, but that was the completion of the project. Is the county paying for the bridge? Yes, they so, are. Oh, so that's not a city. That's not a city. We're, we're, we have a joint, we have a, a MOU with them to pay for that. 
do you know what the ratio is the, between city and county about who's we're, we're splitting it we're splitting it 50 50. okay um that's all for now thank you Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for all that information. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the horse trailer parking. Um, you said that you have no data, zero data about actual demand here. You're, is that correct? We have data on demand, which is that the community values this highly and wants to provide that at this location. But yeah. because we don't have any place for horse trailers to park, we don't have any data on how they're using it. Currently. So you have specific requests for trailer parking at Chapman? We have specific, or the community wants to access the 70% of trails within the West Trail Study area that are available them, to them to ride their horses on. They don't have a way to get there other than riding their horses, which has become increasingly troublesome up Boulder Canyon. So uh, it, it's hard to access the system without a horse trailer at this point. And why is riding up Boulder Canyon, the Canyon Trail, why is that problematic? Well, now there's a trail, but it's a heavy, I mean, Boulder Canyon itself, where uh, until we had a trail recently, there was no way to ride a horse there. I'm not sure about horse use on the Boulder Canyon Trail. That's, that's a new facility, a new and not yet completed facility. I'm sorry, are you saying that they would ride their horses up the road? I'm Boulder saying Canyon. that was the only way to get here by horse prior. Prior, okay. Well, okay. The, the creek path has been there for quite a while. There's relatively recently, it was extended from Four Mile Canyon to, that's Red, to Chapman. But that's been a few years now. Uh, so you don't, we're not clear whether that horses are allowed on the creek path or... I, I don't know if they are. I, I assume that they are allowed on there, but I don't know. And it's a okay. it's a paved trail that's not typically used for equestrians. Uh, no, most of it is unpaved. There's only one short section. There, there's a short section at the bottom that's paved uh, up to the first underpass. And then there's a section from four mile, basically from four mile up to here that's paved. But most of it is unpaved. Um, Okay, uh, I just, um, so, so the, then the, there's no access from here to the rest of the West Trail system, the horse accessible West Trail system is- there? Yes, there's Chapman Drive is now, it goes all the way from Chapman Drive Trailhead up to Flagstaff. And no, so there's- but I mean, other other than Chapman, that Chapman segment, there's no connection to any of the other trails from. Well, once you, here. they're all connected eventually. But, but oh, so th that's really the question: Are horses allowed, for example, on the Ranger Trail, which I think it's the Ranger Trail that goes from the 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 Flagstaff Summit up there's to an, Green. There's a network of trails that accommodate horses on our system. And this is a place where they can access those trails. I am not sure about the specifics of which trails are, are, are currently okay. open to. Really what I'm getting to is, I mean, Chapman is not that long. It's a couple two and of a half. miles, two and a half miles, you know, on a horse, it's, half an hour or something up and back it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be a huge she's, demand she's saying from chapman you can access other parts of the trail system that allow so, horses well oh sorry okay that's Am true Is that yes. What I, yes that's yeah. what she's saying oh, okay it's not just two miles on chapman and then you're done okay it's that's the access to the whole piece of the system here so 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 okay maybe i'm confused because i didn't think for instance horses were allowed up to the top of Green Mountain. Yeah, yeah. right. There are trails there that are. horses so are not allowed on, and they're trails. Pretty much the default is a quest. And, and I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but based on my experience in the West Trail Study Area (CCG), mm -hmm. pretty much horses are allowed. There are certainly trails that where we where the department uh, advises against mm -hmm. horses being um, taken. 
but almost everywhere that hikers can go, horses mm -hmm. can go. Whether or not they do mm -hmm. is a bit of a chicken and egg um, question mm -hmm. in regard to, well, you don't see a lot of horses there because they have nowhere to park their trailers mm -hmm. and they have nowhere to access it. And so um, I just, I, I'm just want can I add one thing? Mm -hmm. um, there is no horse trailer parking at the Flagstaff Summit, is there? No. No. So um, that would be like if we had horse trailer parking mm -hmm. at the summit, then you could go up and down Chapman and access Green mm -hmm. and Shadow Canyon and all the other places. Mm -hmm. But to her point, it's the very southern terminus mm -hmm. of, the, of the Mesa Trail, Dowdy Draw. Mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. El Dorado Springs Drive, which is where the designated horse trailer parking is mm -hmm. to access any of the West TSA, which is broad, Broadway West, El Dorado Springs Drive, and mm -hmm. um, the north. Uh, Boulder, uh, 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 yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. okay. I'm just clarifying so that, uh, and again, the equestrians, uh, are super sensitive about um, trailer parking because that they they have to have it to access the system. Mm -hmm. And again, the trailhead is designed to accommodate emergency vehicles and maintenance vehicles and trailer parking. So you're seeing the that in the in the design that there's a place for trailers to park, but we're also trying to accommodate emergency vehicles and maintenance vehicles being able to access the system and to, for just general use to get around, to know where you're going, be able to park and pull out of the trailhead again. And so we've limited the footprint to the smallest area to accommodate all of those uses, those emergency and maintenance functions, as well as the trailer parking is a component that you see is there's parking for that, but there, we don't have parking for emergency vehicles. That would be a, a special situation. Mm -hmm. And so that safety function is critical to why we have the footprint of the size we do in this area. Okay. Um, and from, I was I was never clear quite clear on the plan so all of is that parking is that whole parking area that is will be paved no I mean it's paved with aggregate paving we have um, concrete at our accessible parking spots and then at, uh, at the walkway and the connection to the pedestrian bridge mm -hmm. and then the majority of the area is going to be aggregate paving so it showed lines on the plans. There are going to be wheel stops. We used a recycled plastic wheel stop that defines the parking spots. Um, you'll have to imagine the lines. OK. OK. Thank you. Uh, I think that's all my questions. OK. Anyone else have questions? George? No? No. Laura? No. ML. Okay, I think, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, do we have anyone who wants to make a public comment? <laughs> um, I don't see anybody here in person, so I'll move to online. If you would like to speak online, please raise your hand. And we have one so far, Lynn Siegel. You can go ahead and unmute yourself for three minutes. Yeah, first of all, I want to be clear um, on if I actually get these three minutes because I was cut off last time. Uh, yes, and you're down to 246 at this point. Right, well, when I'm muted before my three minutes are up, I've got PTSD about even speaking now. And I do have a First Amendment right here. Lynn, and please, your comments, I, will please on say, this. I can say whatever I want, and I can be silent if I want, but I get my three minutes. And I will say done when I am finished. Is that an agreement we can have since you are uh, taking the position of 
telling people what to do, Sarah? Uh, Lynn, please give your comment on this public agenda item. I want to know if we've got an agreement here. I can speak until I'm done and I say done. That's all I need to know. Uh, you can speak on this agenda item. Please go ahead, Lynn. Yes. There have been a lot of discussion on this agenda item that were not within the realm of what Edward Stafford was talking about. So, you know, it was very broad about horse access and all of this stuff. This is simply about buffer zones for a pedestrian bridge. And it sounds fine to me. Um, but since everyone else was talking about other stuff, then I guess I'll talk about other stuff. Um, I would think that it's appropriate for people to ride their horses up here instead of dragging trailers with horses in them up here, that it's a, a big carbon footprint to drive horses around. Personally, I don't um, subscribe to riding horses. I think horses should ride people personally, but that's my opinion. And, um, and I think there are ways for horses to get up into the mountains and then get access to all of this network of trails right from Boulder itself. Um, and the other thing is, I think it's really irrelevant to have any improvements to these pedestrian trails and, and uh, this pedestrian bridge and the buffer zone on it if we get attacked by Iran because of our situation of not following Palestinian basic rights. Done. Thank you, Lynn. All right. Anyone else? No, that looks like that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we will have some discussion, but I would appreciate putting the motion up on the screen, please, so we know what it is exactly we're discussing. Okay, so that is the suggested motion language. Uh, is there any discussion before someone makes a motion? No? Okay. Uh, does someone want to make the motion or shall I just make it? Go ahead. I will make a motion. I don't think it's the motion you, that you were gonna make. I will make a motion. Um, I move to approve WET 2023-00020, a standard stream wetland or water body protection permit to allow construction of a new bridge and trailhead improvements for the Chapman Drive trailhead. Sorry, my, my font is too small. Incorporating the staff memorandum and attached criteria analysis as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval and with the additional condition that the plans be revised to show the south trailer parking and drive loop removed in order to reduce excavation and associated stream and wetland impacts. Uh, does anyone want to second that? Okay, so there's no second for that. All right, so I will make a motion that is what was suggested. Motion to approve WET 2023-00020, a standard stream wetland and water body protection permit to allow construction of a new bridge and trailhead improvements for the Chapman Drive trailhead, incorporating this staff memorandum and attached criteria analysis as findings of fact and sub subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Is there a second? ML has seconded it. Is there any discussion? Yes. So <clears throat> uh, like Kurt, I would have called this up. And like Kurt, I had drafted specific motion language. Um, Kurt and I have different uh, concerns about this, this trailhead. 
mine were focused on the pedestrian bridge. In general, I, I so um, I, I want the message to the department to be that um, the pedestrian bridge, and this is one of these things that has taken on a life of its own, it's been in the works forever, is completely unnecessary. It is whether the county's paying for half and we're paying for half, it, it, uh, the current configuration with the paved creek path going under uh, Boulder Canyon Drive coming up, it's completely ADA compliant. It goes across the current uh, bridge. I know of no requirement for a pedestrian bridge, a 70 foot long by 10 foot wide seal structure that you don't, you don't, do you know the um, value of that bridge? I don't know. You do? You do? Can, can I, I, I would like to know that. I'm sorry, if you're gonna to speak to us, please okay. come up to the, although we are in discussion at this point. The bridge is about $700,000. Um, the current condition would put pedestrians on a vehicle bridge to, that does not accommodate them. So it's not a safe condition. We, we can't invite pedestrians or bicyclists onto a narrow vehicle bridge. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can point to many, many bridges within the city of Boulder that we do exactly uh, that. So, however, uh, uh, you know, the best time to fix a mistake is before it happens. And actually that that's even a bigger number than I anticipated. And anytime we spend money, we have to think about uh, what might we do if we didn't spend that money in this particular case and is it actually required? We have plenty of auto bridges that are poorly rated that need replacement. And anyway, so I'm not going to um, uh, I'm not going to oppose the motion as staff has approved. But this is this is a, an example of um, uh, something that doesn't meet the wetland. I don't think it meets the requirement of the wetland permit in requirement to minimize um, uh, the impacts to the area and, and a 70 foot by 10 foot wide bridge supported on concrete piers over the creek has, has impact in the wetlands. All right, uh, any other comments? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. And I just wanted to clarify that uh, I also felt that we are not meeting the minimization criterion of 939E4. I have that right. Um, when we're including the the um, th this large turnaround and the trailer parking, uh, because we, we've heard zero data, we've heard absolutely zero data from the applicant about the actual demand for this, um, and and I find that that. Is really disappointing. I think that that um, if there were data on the, the the need for this, the demand uh, in this particular location, that would be great, and and that would um, you know meet the requirement. But uh, the minimization criterion specifically talks about the scope, and to me, the scope is greater than is justified based on the data that we have. Uh, and therefore, I don't feel that it meets the criteria. All right, I'm going to respond to that. Part of the reason we don't have data is a the city doesn't the the, the open space mountain parks doesn't necessarily track it all, but also people with horses have not been able to access Chapman Drive. So there's no you're asking. It's like it's you're asking to get data on a on something that is not um, trackable at this point. But all right, we'll go ahead and. Anyone else have comments? Then we'll vote. All right. I'll repeat the motion to approve WET 2023-00020, a standard stream wetland and water body protection permit to allow construction of a new bridge and trailhead improvements for the Chapman Drive trailhead, incorporating this staff memorandum and attached criteria analysis as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Kurt. 
No. Uh, George. Yes. Laura. Yes. Mark. Uh, I'd like to wait. Okay. ML. Yes. I'm a yes. Mark. No. All right. It passes four to two. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Edward. Um, all right, we are going, uh, going to be moving to matters. Um, I'm going to absent myself at this point um, and uh, someone else can take over for the matters portion of the meeting, but I need to head out. So whoever wants to be chairing the rest of the meeting would be great. Thank you very much. Yes. Up. Yeah. I will. <laughs> would somebody like to be nominated to be our temporary chair tonight? I would nominate Laura. I said to somebody Second. want to be nominated. <laughs> Is there any third that? <laughs> yeah, Laura, let's let's go. Let's do it. Okay. All right. I guess I guess um, we have to take a vote. No. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. All right. I guess I'm reluctantly elected. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for your faith in me at this hour of night. Uh, we are on to matters from the planning board, planning director, and city attorneys. We have two items on the agenda. The first is item A, matters, the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project spillway annexation. Who's giving that presentation? Christopher Johnson, our comprehensive planning manager, will be presenting the item this evening. Christopher, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, and hello, planning board members. Uh, I apologize for not being able to attend in person this evening, but I appreciate your flexibility uh, for to join virtually. Uh, give me just a moment. I will pull up the presentation here. All right, and let me just, are you still seeing the full presentation or do you see my presenter view? We see what we should be seeing. We don't see your notes. Excellent. You're good. That's great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, okay, well, great. Well, let's, let's jump in. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, again, as Charles mentioned, my name is Christopher Johnson. I'm the Comprehensive Planning Manager for Planning and Development Services. Um, I am also joined here this evening with uh, Brandon Coleman and Joe Tadeucci from the Utilities Stormwater and Flood Management Department, uh, and then also Bethany Collins from Open Space and Mountain Parks in case there are specific questions to their areas of expertise. Uh, the purpose of this matters item is really to provide an overview, a brief overview of the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project, uh, and more importantly, provide a preview to all of you uh, for the proposed annexation that is associated with the project. Uh, it is scheduled for a public hearing with the planning board in approximately one month coming up on March 5th. The agenda for the evening is to start with a brief overview of the project itself. And specifically, we're gonna focus on the flood wall and spillway portion. That's the primary component um, that is associated with the proposed annexation. Uh, then I'll review that annotation and explain the next steps of the process, and then there will be an opportunity uh, to ask questions of staff after the presentation. So we'll begin uh, with the overview of the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project. Uh, as you probably are aware, South Boulder Creek is over 27 miles long, includes a 136 square mile watershed area. Uh, begins up at the Continental Divide, comes down through the Eldorado Springs area, and then uh, trends to the north and crosses through Boulder and the southern eastern portions, uh, ultimately then joining up with Boulder Creek. You can see the city limits there on the right side, uh, shown in the black outline. Uh, and the flood mitigation project is located really at this critical juncture where South Boulder Creek meets the city limits near uh, Highway US 36 as it enters uh, into Boulder. As a natural system, South Boulder Creek has a history of flooding over time. Uh, it's you know, a natural occurrence and, and major flood events have occurred on South Boulder Creek uh, within the recent past, uh, were recorded in 1938, 1969, and of course in 2013. 
Uh, US 36 was overtopped by the floodwaters during both the 1969 and 2013 storm events. Um, and as a, as a result of the 2013 flood, uh, the drainage way that uh, companies South Boulder Creek contributed to some of the highest damages within the city, um, uh, approximately $35 million from that flood event. You can see there the photograph on the right hand side shows the floodwaters on Koala Drive uh, and really shows why the project is really so important to the life safety of and property within the city. So the key goal here is to protect life safety. Uh, you know, when South Boulder Creek floods and overtops US 36, it directly impacts an area that's commonly referred to as the West Valley. Uh, it includes uh, Fraser Meadows, Kiwadine Meadows, and uh, East Boulder neighborhoods. Um, the mitigation project itself will ultimately protect approximately 2,300 residents in this area and 260 structures that are downstream from this location. There were six key principles that really drove the strategy for the design of the project. Uh, they included floodplain mapping to objectively calculate the benefits of different alternatives that were evaluated, the, um, the inclusion of this spillway and flood wall along US 36, and then an associated flood outlet that allows water to discharge beneath the road and prevent that overtopping uh, condition. The constructability and the importance of limiting impacts to OSMP property, which we'll talk a little bit about here shortly. Uh, and then maintaining existing groundwater conditions and also contributing to the much larger environmental mitigation plan uh, for the 119 acres that are adjacent to this area as part of the CU South property. So quick overview of the entirety of the project uh, consists of a regional detention area that's upstream of US 36 in the area of the larger CU South property. You can see that's shown there in the dashed outline. Uh, the area to the east on the right hand side of the screen shows that existing OSMP property that's outside of the city limits and within the county jurisdiction. Um, the major kind of project components, uh, there's a large earthen embankment, a detention excavation area, the outlet works and the spillway and flood wall, uh, which also then includes that groundwater conveyance system beneath the road. Um, and the environmental restoration area to the to the CU South property once the existing levee is is removed. Tonight we're going to focus uh, more specifically on the flood wall and the spillway itself because that is what is directly related to the annexation request uh, that includes <clears throat> city-owned land and then also the adjacent uh, C dot right of way. I'll, I'll explain that here in more detail just shortly. Uh, zooming into this particular area, you can see the uh, on the graphic, it may be a little bit difficult to see, but there's a blue hatch area that's just on the southern side of the US 36 right of way. That's the location and the area that's needed for construction of that flood wall component. Um, the, the area of that property is approximately 4.1 acres in size. Uh, it's already owned by the city of Boulder. It's currently managed by OSMP. Um, and Ultimately, uh, about half of that area, so about 2.2 acres, will be transferred to uh, management of that 2.2 acres will be transferred to the utilities department once the flood wall is constructed. Uh, and that will occur through an open space disposal process. And then the other half uh, or so of that, about 1.9 acres, will be used on a temporary basis by utilities during the construction uh, uh, of, the, of the flood wall, but then will ultimately be continued to be managed by OSMP going forward. Uh, the spillway and the flood wall itself, are, as I mentioned, are located on city-owned property. They're close to the CDOT right away as possible uh, in order to minimize the impacts on that OSMP property. Um, the construction area and the associated annexation are really needed in order to um, permit and build the flood wall structure, but also uh, going forward, so utilities crews can perform ongoing operations and, and maintenance of that structure and that facility over time. I'm sorry, Christopher, could you clarify who are we annexing that land from? Is that city owned land already? Is that it is, is that... that's correct? Yes, it's city owned land currently. So it's it's um we're annexing ourselves uh, as part of this, but it does include 
that CDOT right-of-way area. So that's um, obviously under different ownership. So that's partly why we're going through um, the, the sort of standard uh, petitioned annexation process as opposed to doing more legislative annexation. I'm not sure I entirely and, understand that, but I'm sure uh, it will be more AJ, explained. Can I interject real quickly? Yeah, please um, do. I, I think um, it's unincorporated county, but city owned land. So Correct. to get it into the city city limits would require annexation. Gotcha. So it's in area two currently, but we own it. It's Correct. actually in area three. We'll talk yeah. about that. Yeah. It's in area three. Okay. But, but it's unincorporated. So Okay. So it's That's in the right. county, but we own it. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So uh, moving forward then quickly, just to give you a, a kind of brief update on the design uh, of the flood wall and its spillway, the <clears throat> concept is still being finalized and refined. It's, it's in about in a 60% design uh, stage currently. Uh, it will incorporate grading and landscape materials, particularly on the US 36 side, uh, to better blend with the surrounding environment and reduce the potential for vandalism of the wall and also minimize the visibility of that um, upon entry into the city along the highway. And it, uh, as, as we continue to sort of further refine that, um, looking at opportunities to incorporate additional um, grading and changes in grading so it, it uh, avoids a, a really kind of monotonous engineered um, design and becomes more naturalistic. Uh, we're discussing a lot of these concepts with uh, with CDOT and city transportation staff, as well as several staff landscape architects within planning and development services, including Chris Riccadello um, and myself and Kathleen King are also both um, professional landscape architects. And, uh, and so we're working with uh, our utilities partners and others to, to review the design of this as it comes forward. So moving then into the proposed annexation, um, you know, this, this certainly falls directly within planning board's purview. And that's really the purpose of, of why we're here this evening is to give you a bit of an update on this. There's a number of uh, associated things that are happening and, and we'll talk about all of those uh, as well. Um, really the, the goal here of, uh, of this matters item is just to provide an overview of the information on the proposed annexation. I, I will not get into the full sort of evaluation of criteria and staff recommendation. We'll hold that uh, and present that to you in about a month when we come back for the public hearing in March. So the purpose of the annexation is to help uh, really overall sort of help the team think creatively about the design, give us some, some flexibility in terms of interdepartmental coordination, uh, and in particular, really understanding um, and facilitating that permitting process and the, ultimately the construction of the flood wall and the spillway, uh, bringing this all with, into the city uh, will provide for a, greater sort of jurisdictional clarity about who's, you know, who's in charge, who's responsible for permitting, uh, and really enable that smoother coordination amongst a number of different departments that are involved here. Um, and that uh, um, applies to not only sort of the phase that we're in currently in terms of permitting, but also through construction, and ultimately the ongoing uh, operations and maintenance of the facility going forward. So this is an overview uh, aerial image of that proposed annexation area. You can see in the yellow dashed line, uh, it does include the CDOT right of way. So the um, you're probably familiar with the Foothills Parkway and Table Mesa interchange there. <clears throat> it includes that portion. And then in the sort of orange red area, just to the south of the right of way, that is that four acre, a slightly greater than four acre area of city owned land that is currently in the county. Uh, and would be annexed into uh, into the city. The the overall scale or the overall size of the proposed annexation is about 27 acres, a little bit more than that. Um, and just for reference, this is um, within that uh, Boulder County jurisdiction. It's currently zoned as rural residential. Uh, it is uh, within area three, so the city owned portion. The city owned uh, pardon, property. Christopher, we have a, a clarification question from Mark. Yeah. yeah. On that page, because that could you go back one page? Yeah, sure, Mark. So, where it says in red, city owned area, is mm -hmm. that referencing uh, the area above the type in yellow and yellow dash and orange, or is that referencing the entire area 
bounded by the red border? It's it's the latter. The city actually owns that entire parcel, but we are only proposing to annex in that 4.1 acre portion that's just south of the CDOT right of way. Does that so make sense? What what is the city? What is currently annexed that is adjacent to the proposed annexation? Don't don't we have to have contiguity to annex a property? Yes, and we uh, there is contiguity all along the western and northern side. The city also owns land that's to the north of the C dot right of way, as well. Okay. Yep. And will the area south and west, I guess, of in, in the area where it says city owned area, mm -hmm. uh, will that become OSMP property? It already is. Yep. It's already city owned and currently managed by OSMP and that will remain. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and as we as we get into the Q and A, I could <clears throat> probably pull up a, a GIS map that would that would show where that city on property uh, is, if that's helpful as part of the discussion. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Please go on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a few more slides here. Um, so you can see within the proposed annexation area, the the portion of city owned property that's south of uh, of the highway is within area three and portions of the right-of-way itself are, are split between area two and area three. You can see the interchange portion is, is in area two, and then the portion that's to the east is within area three. Um, now, normally, uh, you know, we don't consider area three properties as part of annexations, but there is specific policy language um, that uh, area three properties can be annexed if they meet very specific criteria, and, and this is one case where, where it does. Um, they do need to be publicly owned. So property needs to be um, publicly owned. In this case, it's owned by the city. Um, it is intended or must be intended to remain in Area 3. There is a uh, classification called Area 3 Annex, which um, is a bit unique in that it's Area 3. And it's intended to remain as open space and rural preservation, but is actually within the city boundary. Uh, it will not require a full range of urban services uh, or that the area is being included within the city's jurisdiction uh, for health, welfare, and, and safety reasons. Uh, as another point of reference, just in terms of the uh, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use designations, um, so it's it's a bit of a um, split. Uh, choose your own adventure here. There's some open space acquired, which is the city-owned property um, that would primarily be used for that uh, construction of the flood wall and spillway. Uh, and then there's portions of the CDOT right of way that fall within the public, semi-public, and then the park urban other land use designation. The zoning in the surrounding area is um, uh, primarily public, as you can see on the west and on the north side. Um, as part of the annexation, we would be required to identify and establish a, a, a zone district here. Uh, the proposal that's included within the annexation application is to uh, continue with and apply the public zoning uh, to that area. It's defined within our code as um, public areas in which public and semi-public facilities and uses are located, including without limitation, governmental and educational uses. Um, and so we'll, uh, uh, you know, provide additional information on that in terms of its logical extension of, of city zoning, but that is what is included currently within the annexation proposal. And then finally, next steps. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there's a there's kind of an overlapping uh, suite of things that are all uh, in play as part of this process. Uh, first, the construction of the flood wall and spillway includes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, includes this request for the transfer of management of uh, so that city-owned land from OSMP oversight to utilities management. Um, that will need to occur through an open space disposal process. So both OSBT uh, and council will take action on the disposal um, uh, request. 
Second is the annexation proposal that we just reviewed. So you yourselves, planning board and council will take action on that item. And then finally, uh, the mapping and functional evaluation of wetlands on the larger CU South properties so that's to, adjacent to the West uh, must also be adopted by council. And that's gonna occur through a separate ordinance. Um, as you are aware, wetland mapping is typically included at the time of annexation, but when the uh, CU South property was annexed uh, through the annexation agreement, uh, it was established that that um, procedure and, and that mapping would occur at a later date through a separate process. So that is also being included as part of this. And just so you have an awareness of some of the dates and, and things that will be happening over the next couple of months, um, the uh, OSBT and City Council are going to be hosting a joint public hearing on February 22nd regarding that open space disposal uh, request. Uh, OSBT will deliberate and ultimately make a decision at their regular March 13th meeting. Um, the annexation request, uh, so the resolution and the ordinance for that will be introduced uh, on the City Council docket on February 15th. Uh, planning board, as I mentioned, we are scheduled to host the public hearing with you, and then you will have the opportunity to take action on March 5th. Uh, and then on that CU South wetland mapping, that'll be introduced for first reading with city council on March 7th. Uh, and then all three of those items will come forward for public hearings and action on the city council agenda March 21st. So um, we've got, you know, three, three separate processes that we are aligning uh, to, you know, all uh, eventually uh, reach city council on March 21st. That's the, that's the target date. And, and really that goal of March 21st is, uh, is primarily focused around uh, maintaining the uh, anticipated construction schedule and timing um, for the project, uh, our utilities. Staff have done a really tremendous job to, you know, get that uh, organized and, and strategized coming into um, uh, beginning construction, hopefully before the end of this year. And so we want to make sure that we can uh, support that and help facilitate that. And with that, that is uh, that's the end of the presentation. So we are happy to answer questions. And as I mentioned, we have both utilities and OSMP staff um, here this evening as well. Thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, I can't speak for everybody here, but as someone who was not part of the CU South annexation, that was extremely helpful. I really appreciate hearing what you are doing to try to coordinate the very complicated process to make this a reality. Um, other board members, do you have any questions? Let's start with clarifying questions, and then if there's discussion, we can do that. I see Kurt. Hi, uh, yeah, Christopher, thanks for that presentation. That was great. Um, I wasn't, and, and I apologize, you might have said this and I missed it, but it mm -hmm. wasn't clear to me why we need to annex the CDOT property as opposed to just the spillway and wall area. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, Kurt, thanks. Um, we did analyze that and that was one of the options that we had uh, originally kind of um, were proceeding down that process. Um, what we ultimately made the decision to do and include that CDOT right-of-way is that particularly, um, uh, as I mentioned, the design of the, of the flood wall along the, along the highway, there's, there's really a desire to help soften that. And so including landscape and, and um, grading along that edge, we, we pretty quickly determined that there was likely going to be some, some level of disturbance within the CDOT right-of-way. Now we will we will still need to get permits for changes within that right of way area, but having that under city jurisdiction um, and and not within the county will help uh, will help facilitate you know that that permitting process. So that ultimately is why we included the the CDOT right of way as well. Okay, thanks. And I think you, that you did say that, and it didn't register the first time. But yeah, yeah sure. Uh, the other question, just quickly, and this is probably a minor issue, but do you know if there are like traffic enforcement ramifications then from the fact that now all of a sudden we are have jurisdiction over a larger portion of US 36? I uh, we did talk about that and 
rather than give you an incorrect answer, I would love to be able to follow up with our, uh, you know, with other departments on, on that and just confirm that. I believe, I, I believe that yes, there, you know, there will be some additional, um, uh, you know, police and other, you know, traffic related, transportation related oversight um, of the area. But uh, as a federal highway, um, you, you know, state patrol also um, provides a lot of those services already. But, um, but I, I can, I can, jot that down as a question and follow up with with a clear answer you don't need to that's that's fine that that's a good okay. enough answer. thank you great thank you for those questions kurt anybody else have clarifying questions seeing none oh mark uh the current multi-use path on the southwest mm -hmm. edge of highway 36 mm -hmm. and is that going to be dug up, moved, and part of the softening process? You, you showed it. One of the one of the images kind of showed uh, that the the flood wall actually kind of undulating and some trees and stuff, so that the whole thing to try to minimize vandalism. So, will the multi use path stay on that uh, south side of uh, thirty six, and will it be redone? to be a more interesting, but be part of the uh, softening of the flood wall? Mm -hmm. I, uh, we don't have a clear decision on that just yet. Um, we are coordinating with our transportation staff and others to, um, you know, to uh, ensure that that facility obviously remains, um, you know, remains functional. I think there's a, a question as to, um, you know, the desire for that to be a, um, a fairly, you know, fairly rapid, um, you know, bicycle multi-use, bicycle focused multi-use path um, versus something that might be more meandering. Um, I think those are those are the questions that we're just trying to resolve right now. So I think it's possible that it could be uh, altered in some fashion, um, but as far as its overall geographic location, it, it would remain, uh, you know, on that side of the highway before crossing over to the north side. Great, thanks very much. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Any other clarifying questions? Okay, um, we can have discussion. And just as a reminder, there's no action required of us tonight. This is just a heads up for us to make it smoother when they come back to us for an annexation decision and get some of our base knowledge up, up to speed. Any discussion tonight? I don't see any. So Christopher, thank you so much. And thank you to your colleagues for joining us. Even though we didn't get to talk to them, we appreciate that they're here. We look forward to seeing you when you come back. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda, Kurt, do you mind if I crib off of you? Um, we have one more matters item. This is an information item, an update on the Boulder Airport community conversation. I see there's no presentation. Um, who's handling this item? Um, no one here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have feedback... I'm happy to make sure that it gets transmitted to the right place. Or if there's um, feedback that folks want to send me directly, there wasn't a contact in the memo for um, who to send it to directly. So if um, there is comment on um, the memo, you can send it to me directly and I'll make sure that it gets to the right place. Okay. So there was an informational memo in our packet that hopefully we all had a chance to read. Does anybody have any questions or feedback that they want Charles to convey to the transportation department? I don't see any, but thank you for including that memo in our packet. It's really good to, to get that update. Yeah. Thank you so much. Are there any other matters from staff? Nothing from staff tonight. Okay. Matters from the city attorney's office? Nothing from me either. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Hella. Anything from members of the planning board? Any matters you want to bring up? I have one quick item before we go. Okay, I'll say my quick item is, you know, since Lisa unfortunately had to resign, we don't have a vice chair between now and when we uh, redo our officers in April. Hella, do we need to have a vice chair to attend like the agenda set a meeting, agenda setting meetings and so forth? Yeah, I think it would be good to appoint a vice chair. It didn't occur to me either until we were without one today. Yes, so I'm not gonna suggest that we do that tonight. Uh, I think Sarah might have some input on that, but um, maybe everybody be thinking about if you would like to be vice chair 
um, between now and when we reelect officers. Any just um, the the schedule for appointment. People roll off in. Well, what meeting will be the first meeting for new board members? Should be the first meeting in April. Right, the first meeting in April. Thank you. So you would be signing up, and what are the duties of the vice chair, just so that we're all clear? Well, generally, the vice chair chairs the meeting if the chair is absent, um, but has the vice chair always attended our agenda meetings? Um, it depends on the chair. If, they're, if they have availability, um, they'll attend, but they're not required. So before a board meeting, the Monday before the Tuesday at 1, we have an agenda meeting that usually takes no more than 30 minutes to kind of talk about what's what's on, on the agenda, how long we think each item takes, and just plan that through. And the vice chair is, is, may attend, but it's not absolutely necessary if the chair is there. Okay, you said it's on the Monday before, so the day before the planning it's board meeting. It's the day before, yeah. And what at, time? At 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that gives everybody something to chew on and think about if you might want to be vice chair. Any commentary or thoughts before on that item before we close it? I would only say that uh, while I never chaired the Transportation Advisory Board, I was vice chair. And the... Uh, the addition of uh, a, a, a second person at the agenda meeting, I found to be very valuable and um, valuable to the chair, valuable to myself, and um, better should the chair not be able to attend. Anyway, so I, I think it's a, uh, some boards do it differently where the, where the vice chair almost never attends. Sometimes some boards do it where the vice chair almost always attends. I would <clears throat> recommend the latter. So if you're thinking about vice chairing, then that that Monday at one o'clock, I think is an important uh, thing to be part of. You mean so that somebody isn't caught flat footed in the middle of a meeting having to chair it? <laughs> yes. And that and, never and happens. does though. And it does an happens. amazing job yeah. nonetheless. <laughs> and 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 just the uh, the burden is shared of trying to just think about everything. And anyway, I think it's um, I think it's a good addition. I think it's a good suggestion. Any other thoughts on this topic? If Charles. you guys could call up more of Edward's items, I just really <laughs> like having him at planning board. And I think he makes an excellent planner and does an excellent presentation. I'm so. allowed to object to that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say during um, a phone call Kurt and I had, I would say, not speaking for Kurt, that Edward wasn't really super happy with us calling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like having him at planning board. Okay. And so here you can read the room. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoyed seeing you tonight as well, Edward. And we'll try not to increase your workload too much, but you do an excellent job. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close that agenda item. Anything else from members of the board? I move we adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Any objection? All in favor? Hands? Aye. All right. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Aye. Aye.